Following the whirlwind day-to-day -day existence of Vice President Selena Meyer, Julia Louis-Dreyfus in her Emmy-winning role, Veep hilariously skewers everyday office politics. Season three follows Selena and her staff as they eye a possible run for Selena in the presidential primaries. As always, Veep shows us that in Washington, even the most banal decisions can have ripple effects. Watch the season three premiere this Sunday, April 6, 2014. In case you forgot what year it was. 10.30, 9.30 Central on HBO. I think that went rather well. I'm doing the whole thing. And then... And then, and then. <laughs> You know what, like the song you were close, but then it had a little bit of a feeling of the Rocky theme song. <laughs> Led by all the, all the filing cabinets. And <laughs> Don't be misled. <laughs> Welcome to Kevin Pollock's chat show. We're very excited uh, for tonight's and today's festivities here on our fifth anniversary show. Woo! Sammy! Happy anniversary! Jeremy, do you believe it? It's five years. Sammy, you're looking back on the five years. First thing that comes to mind is. Um, we're still not ready. Hmm? What? Weird Al Yankovic. Weird Al Yankovic? Yep. That's you're going to go to for your favorite episode. Yeah. Favorite guest. Yeah. I, know I mean, until today. Right, right, of course. Nicely played. And Jamie? I didn't know we had to pick favorites. Yeah, no, I'll come back to you. Um, Kenny? It's a tie between Ivan Reitman and Lisa Loeb. Between Lisa Loeb and Ivan Reitman, the evil Dr. Chen throws up. He almost got off on the camera. top of his head. He coughed that one up. Um, yeah, unbelievably excited. Fifth anniversary. They said it wasn't possible. I want to thank. Uh, who, who said? The actual creator of the internet, Jason Calacanis, for being uh, the host. Uh, I, want, I want names. Who mind, said, body, who and said building. Do you want names? I want names. Uh, I think that cunt Jane Campion said it. She said she, it would never last. She left here. She yeah. an Aussie? No. Jane Campion sounds like she's an Aussie. Yeah. But she's not. Well, you call her a cunt. It's more socially, it's more socially acceptable. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to talk to our guest and get his. Uh, a take on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, no, I, I was uh, putting together my notes on what I might say in uh, discussing the five-year uh, victory, and uh, I put together some of my favorite guests, a list. Oh, I didn't realize I get more oh, I love how you did this yeah. and didn't tell me to prepare Yeah, that's anything. exactly right. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, Tom Hanks, Larry David, Taryn Killam. Taryn Killam just fucking know, killed Taren me. Killam you just named killed. three of our last six guests. Eddie Izzard. Now we're going back four years. <laughs> mm. Ben Fold, Seth MacFarlane, Dick Van Dyke. Come on. Dick Van, Dick motherfucking Van Dyke. Dyke. Almost his last interview. Almost his last interview. His right. car set on fire the very next day. Yeah. Dana Gould, crushed beyond belief. Jason Mansukas. Mm -hmm. Stephen Merchant, mainly because he's 6'11". Barry Sonnenfeld, John Favreau, Alan Arkin. I've got 75 names here. I'm not going to go through them all. We, we really have been insecure. Sugar Ray Leonard was the most viewed live, 85,000 eyeballs live. Which nowadays would make us a hit on cable. If I may, mm -hmm. it's 170,000 eyeballs. 170 what? 170,000 eyeballs. I, oh, I see what you did. You'd have to give or take <laughs> someone with a pink eye. <laughs> right. Like, that's yeah. not an exact figure. Approximately 170,000. How, how big is your viewership with pirates? <laughs> Next you know These point. are fair questions. Yeah. These and also, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. impersonators <laughs> who are so committed to their art they had an eye removed. Um, and the other, now that you've had a moment or two, Jamie, just pick one off the top. I know, but 
love you did admit this because I was. Well, I always say that the filmmakers and the comedians mm -hmm. are always my favorite. So Landis, who, is he still our longest guest? Uh, he does have the record, two hours and 52 yeah. minutes. Mr. So, Hanks came just shot right. And Rob Reiner and James L. Brooks and yeah. Ivan Reitman, as uh, Kenny had mentioned. But I always found like, the, the filmmakers and the comedians, too. Like uh, when Hubel and Shear were on. Holy shit. Yeah, and Manzoukas, as you said. Like any of, yeah, those yeah. are always my favorite shows. Lorraine Newman was pretty great. Um, I got a lot to live up to. Yeah, oh, a little bit. I just wanted to put Sorry. all the pressures possible. Did you do this before every guest? <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. no I very much enjoyed Ivan Reitman. <laughs> <laughs> What have you made? <laughs> yeah. oh, Remember when Jesus DVD? Christ was here? <laughs> <laughs> um, coming to you live on the YouTube. How do you watch us? How do you uh, let us know? Contact at KevinPollocksChatShow.com. That's the email. Contact at KevinPollocksChatShow.com. Sub subscribe to us if you dare. Send us your uh, uh, questions for the guests whenever possible. We have a few from Twitter today. Uh, record your own Larry King game and throw that at us and see if you can't win yourself a T-shirt. Are, are you listening to us on Earwolf, the number one comedy podcast in the world? Anybody? Somebody? Nobody? Everyone? <laughs> uh, new episode every Tuesday. Okay. I can answer that question on behalf of somebody. Okay. I volunteer at this amazing organization called yes. 826 LA. Check it out, 826LA.org. It's a nonprofit. We uh, do after school tutoring and field trips for grade school kids. It's amazing. It is amazing. And uh, one of the new volunteer today, and she about like, mm, it was towards the end of the field trip. She's like, I just have to say, I really love the chat show, and I couldn't, and I recognized you right away, and I didn't want to say anything to like make this awkward. Her name's Katie. She's Aww. great. Oh. And she used to watch the show live. That's how she recognized me, but now, she um, she listens while she runs. Mm. Nice. So there you go. See, let there us you help go. you exercise. She went blind. <laughs> As it turns out, <laughs> dear Katie, you can, you can take those two eye bulbs. Oh man, yeah. we're down to 195. <laughs> they blew it. Some Certain ones, though, she it. says she does like the Tom Hanks when she started to listen to, and she's like, no, I have to watch this. So she does both. Yeah, like today's. Tune in for this guest, won't you? Right. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Please welcome. Jeff Nugent. Yes, that's you've done your research. <laughs> let, let me ask how the name change came about because I, I wanted to change my name. Jeffrey Nugent. Yeah, I yeah, please. And I love the spelling too. Jeffrey with a G. Yeah, yeah Jeffrey. Oh, my, my name was Jeffrey James Nugent, and I had a. Uh, this is going to sound so wanky. I had a promising opera singing career. And, We've um, got a break for commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? I, um, what does that mean? I studied at WAPA, the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts. Of course. Where Hugh Jackman went. You know, I did a, little, a year of musical theatre and then I did a couple of years of classical. And then I uh, sang in the Australian Opera twice in the chorus. Uh, in the Flying Dutchman by Wagner and uh, Romeo and Juliet by Charles Gounod. Because French. you had trained to sing I was, in the chorus I, I of was, opera? I was, I, was, I was talent scouted as a singer at a school musical by the. I, was, I came from a very working class family. Right. And I sang in a school musical, and then someone from the Australian Opera came along and said, Your son has skills. And they sent me off to singing lessons, and I got full scholarship ride. Uh, university and so dear lord I was gonna be like and I, but I always wanted to be a stand-up comedian from the time that I was like 10 right. so all I wanted to do was be a stand-up comedian and here they are saying no no you're gonna sing an opera yeah yeah, yeah. And, and also it, at least it wasn't like I wasn't going to university and doing accountancy at least it was in the performing arts and I thought all right well this would be good and I don't have to pay and the university thank God was on the other side of Australia like it wasn't near my parents place there was a bit of freedom you know so I went to Perth right and uh, then I, I, I got nodules on my vocal cords, which meant I couldn't really sing anymore. Thankfully. And, and had them removed. And I was silent for about two months. And in that two months, I plotted on how to become a stand-up comedian. I, I started researching where... At the age of... Oh, uh, 22. Okay. I actually did a couple of open spots when I was 17, but I don't include those because they went terribly. But then I said, all right, I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. And then this, that was one of the first things I said when I could talk again after after the eight weeks of not talking. Holy shit! Yeah, I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, oh, "I'm going to become a stand-up comedian." It was like the first thing I said. Was well, the next thing you said, "Hey, hey, where are you going?" Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the and the thing was, the, back to the name change. The reason is because I thought maybe if I'm really shit at the stand-up comedy and it doesn't work out, I still have to keep the singing thing, and I wanted to be a dirty comic. And Jeffrey Nugent, the opera singer, couldn't be a dirty comedian. So uh, James is my middle name. So I changed to Jeffrey James, and I thought Jim Jeffrey sounded better. And I haven't actually been called Jeffrey by anyone, including my mother, in maybe six years. 
And so, as much as our uh, friend of the show and longtime pal of mine, Dana Carvey, likes to joke when Sting decided to explain to his pub mates that he, they needed to stop calling him Gordon and start, start yeah. calling him Sting, yeah. how did it go initially when you told your friends that you were going to be Jim? Um, it, it was a very gradual thing. You start, I mean, it's not Sting. It's not a. Yeah, you start going. I go. Um, so I rang up the comedy promoter and I said, oh, "Okay, my name is Jim Jeffries," and it was weird. And then they said, "Also, it was Je Jeffrey Nugent spelt that way." Nugent's not a very popular name in Australia. I think now I'd like to be called Jim Nugent because it's a bit more rock and roll, but it's too late now. Um, and also because, like, I'm, I'm anti-gun and he's like the pro-gun guy. It would be <laughs> a nice little yeah. Uh, a pocket, yeah. But um, you, you just get, gradually your friends go, come along to the gig and you go, oh, I'm, I'm calling myself Jim Jeffries, and they go, Do we call you Jim now? Or no, no, it was so weird. You go, No, just keep calling me Jeffrey. And then over time they just start calling you Jim, and then it's fine. So it just organically. My changed. son has my stage name. He doesn't have my name on my birth certificate. He's got it. He's and so my girlfriend's got one name, one surname. I've got Jeffries. I'm Nugent on my passport, and my son is Jeffries. And you try going through an airport with a kid when all three of you have different names. Hey, you, how, how does that go? Oh, you get asked some questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who do they search first? Well, also, she's a Canadian passport, I'm an Australian passport, and he's an American passport. That helps. With all different <laughs> names. It's uh, creepy. But I, it's the, who do they search first? I'll tell you what, if you ever want to be a drug... I was writing a movie for a while, and I had to stop. You know whenever you like come up with a good idea, and then some other movie comes on, and you're like, fuck, that just fucking ruined took my... took the idea? Or? I had this idea where I was going to be like a guy that lived in Thailand and I realized that babies never get searched at the airport. I carry my baby through the airport. No one's ever gone take the nappy off, cut the nappy off. <laughs> you could line that thing with cocaine. No one would ever stop you. No one's like even going to get the dog to sniff the baby. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> no the dog knows what's, what it's in there. Yeah, no one's ever going to do that. Yeah. So I had this idea that I adopted this baby from a, an orphanage and then I got it through custom. And then, you know, obviously a relationship between me and the child grew, blah, 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 cries the end. Um, <laughs> That's, that's how I write films. Is, uh, it, <laughs> is it also how you pitch them? Yeah, yeah, that'd yeah. That'd be a great pitch. <laughs> Cries the end. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then that movie, The Millers, came out where the guy made a family do a drug run and I went, ah, oh, well, that's fucked. Yeah. Can't do that. And it did really, really well. And they're probably going to do another one. Did it? Did it do well, did it? it? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I can't do my, my adopter Asian baby storyline in Thailand. Just, I think you could. So I think we're slightly edgier, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think yeah, right? if nothing else, they opened the door. Yeah. It, 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 and like now it, we're ready for the... It, like him just going in saying to a stripper that looks like Jennifer Aniston, can you be my wife? And she's like, oh, no, but I'm so keen on stripping. Whatever. <laughs> whatever will I do? Yeah. I also, think, I, also, I also feel that Jason Sudeikis <laughs> stole my career. Every actor has this thing. Really? Every actor has this thing where they go, that's the person that your career could have been. Oh, wow. I auditioned for a movie. Don't get Sam and I even started on this conversation. I the list for, is endless. I auditioned for a movie that didn't do very well, but it was... The part was originally offered to my friend Reese Darby, and he couldn't do it for some other reason. Reese Darby, a fly of the Concords, and he just couldn't do it. And so I went along to the audition, and they liked me. And it was for a movie called Going the Distance. Sure. And it was a Drew Barrymore, oh, Justin, Justin Long film. Yes, when they it was. A friend of ours wrote it. And I tested in front of Drew Barrymore with Justin Long. She was the producer on it. Yeah. And uh, I obviously didn't do well in my testing, but I went through like three or four auditions, like loads of auditions. for Someone this loved you. Yeah, someone was fighting for me. And then in the end, Jason Sudeikis doing. I think that was his first movie, and he was just the best, fr the best friend. So I always look. Ever since go, then, let's see. I could have had us. That's now. the guy. That's right. the guy. He's bloody. He was in it at the Oscars. I'm sure he's very nice, married to Olivia Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting her pregnant. I'm sure he's kicking himself on a daily basis. I have my TV show on FXX at 10 p.m. on every Wednesday. If you want to advertise Veep, yeah. we, we, Dan Bacadal is in my show, who is also on Veep. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Dan Bacadal plays uh, the congressman that she hates. Yeah. He, and it's weird because he, he plays does a great job. A complete bastard in that one, and he plays like a sniveling <laughs> idiot in my one. <laughs> Two polar opposites. But a bit of a sweetheart. Oh, he's a great guy. He yeah. plays like my best friend, but just a drunken idiot, and then like the hardest balls bastard in the world in that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the. Can I get you some more water, sir? We have some water. Oh, right a here. little bit more water. I'm trying yeah, yeah. on ice here. Like, a, like um, an anorexic who's trying to feel full. Sure, I understand. <laughs> um, let's jump to, uh, to, the, to the legit. Why right. not? Let's, I mean, uh, I've got. 
I've got, we can go any which way we want here. For actually, you know what? Let's go to, to one that I'm, uh, was surprised to see in a tweet of yours. Sure. Are you really an uh, base, American baseball Love fan? Love baseball. Crazy what? for baseball. When did this happen? Um... Everyone kept on. T okay, I grew up watching cricket, sure. which is a five-day sport, and there, even after five days, there's a twenty percent chance it will end in a draw. Uh huh. Right. So I'm a patient man, <laughs> and I can see the thrillingness. Of, I can see how amazing that is that we have to finish it within these amount of days, and each section, each day of play has its own twists and turns, like a drama. I, I like how long it is. Uh, and then everyone started going. I went to an, I went to a couple of American sports and didn't really dig them, and then. And then people went, oh, baseball's slow. Everyone in America seems to hate baseball. I don't know how it does so well, but whenever you talk to people, they're like, oh, baseball's just so... Well, you're talking to non-baseball fans, yeah. first of all. I, I went along, it was like three hours. It was the fastest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, What's I, the hurry? I, I could only get three pints of beer in. I do like a pint an hour. <laughs> I'm not even getting drunk at this thing. I don't even have an opportunity to get wasted. This is a really quick sport. <laughs> What's the hurry? Yeah. Where's the fire, baseball and players? You know, you know what else I love? I love that. As a stand-up comedian, you're normally working on the weekends. I go to a game on a fucking Monday. Unbelievable. Brilliant. <laughs> During the day, even. During the day on a Monday. And I just look around like... Why are you all working? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like I, I know that my seats that I bought are like a hundred bucks. How are you affording? <laughs> We're meant to be in such a horrible situation. Yeah. And I, I wear the outfits and everything. I, it's, it's weird. I got my, I got my son a Matt Kemp jersey, and in my son's entire life, Matt Kemp has been injured. <laughs> <laughs> like when my, when my girlfriend was pregnant. He was the best player in the Dodgers. Now he's made a fucking porcelain, that guy. If he runs down to first, oh, I'm out for six weeks. And then all I, all I, all I hear is, oh, it's coming, the injury's coming along well. And I feel like he's just priming himself up for the other leg to go. You know, so I, I got my son in like a Kemp jersey and now there's other babies that are wearing like Yassel Puig or Hanley Ramirez jerseys and they're looking at my son like he's a fuckwit, you know. <laughs> so I just keep him strapped to my chest so that no one can see the back of him. <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so are you, are you automatically a Dodgers fan because you live here Well, now, the Dodgers or? were the first game I went to. Right. Um... And also, it's the nearest stadium to my house. Yeah, sure. And and you know, you, you want to. I find when I moved to England, I became a Fulham um, football fan. I became very into soccer. In fact, soccer is like my favourite sport, probably. And then, but it's, it, you know, soccer is my winter sport, and baseball is my summer sport. There you go. Um, and you know, it's it, the best way to fit in with others in a foreign country, especially if you're planning to live there. The easiest way, in my mind, is to learn about their sports. Yeah. Because then you can talk to them a bit, and if you really get into it, and you have an accent like this, and you have a little bit of knowledge, and you give facts and figures, then you're people, blow some minds. people are impressed with you. Yeah, they are. So I I read up and I I have that MLB app. Sure. Every day I check the little stories that are coming up. I was very excited that the Dodgers just played in Australia in my home cricket ground and they beat the Diamondbacks twice. But uh, it was funny to watch it on the TV. I actually watched it on the internet because we don't have the Dodgers channel at the moment. Uh, if you've got direct TV, uh, I need my Dodgers. People put the little protest in and we'll get the channel back. It's going to be take like six weeks or something. Only, only, only Time Warner can watch it in LA at the moment. Anyway, besides that, so I'm watching the game, but it's funny to watch things that Americans are like, oh, this is interesting, right? They had a, like a rundown with Puig between first and second, and he was right in the, they were throwing it back and forth, and he was scared. And the Australians were laughing like they were watching Benny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> they thought, these, people, does, these people are fucking that idiots. That never dawned on me. Of course it would look like Benny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> this can't be on purpose. They just see, they're going, oh! <laughs> Don't go that way. You'll just throw the ball that way again. <laughs> oh, you idiot. Now you got to go. Ah, oh, he's fooled you. <laughs> and it was, there was an audible 40,000 people laughing and pointing. Yeah. Now, Sam, what, what are the statistics on how many people have successfully Gotten escaped out of the, rundown? the pickle? I, I believe it's under 10%. Yeah, it's got to be under 10%. Yeah. It's yeah, a very low number. happens, it's exciting. But, right, but what they'll usually do is people will deliberately get into rundowns if there's already a runner at third sure. to try to buy him an extra second to, to score. And that's what he was doing, but yeah. he, didn't actually, uh, he didn't actually do it. Yeah. Hey, Gordon was at third, and he's like meant to be the fastest guy. But I, I threw the first pitch at... at um, at uh, at the Cubs. 
<laughs> Sammy's team. Didn't make, so didn't make the distance. <laughs> you couldn't get 60 feet? I, I, I could now in hindsight, sure. <laughs> but, but you got to do that before you I, get there. I had been to maybe 15 games to, to see. I uh -huh. never played the sport, but I'd become like a... Oh, that guy's, I figured it all out. Yeah. Were you in Chicago for the fest? I was there for the Chicago uh, uh, Just for Last just Comedy for Festival. Oh. And it was against the Milwaukee Bucks. Not Milwaukee Bucks, that's the basketball thing. The, the Brewers. Brewers. And... When the guy came out and handed me the ball, the thought that went through my head was, you've never held a baseball. Oh, God. Oh, God. And I never even thought about it. Oh. I've never held one. I... <laughs> there must be footage of you doing that. <laughs> and I had all these, like, comedy ideas that I was going to, like, check for the runner and stuff. Bill Murray's but... still done the greatest thing I've ever seen, and it was at a Cubs game, which I'll tell you after this guy. If I had my time over, I could have made the distance easy with a cricket ball. Of course. I could have made it over the top. I mean, yeah. Because I trained for that as a child. Right. I'm not saying trained, but I've done that motion over and over again. But I threw it once, and I probably need Tommy John surgery because it really hurt my arm. <laughs> Tommy John, listen to him. Tommy John surgery. Again, these are baseball terms that are slightly deep yeah, so from I, someone from I, another country. Yeah. I, I, it, it bounced. Would you? It, no, I actually made the distance six feet off to the left in the dirt. And there's, there's a YouTube footage of it, which Opie and Anthony have taken the piss out of me for. Sure, of course. Um, of someone on the phone, and the guy on the phone is such a fuckwit. It's he's just like, go back to Australia, you fucking asshole. That's like, his review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Like, like, and there is like, because I wasn't famous. There was an audible. But all I remember was, it was the Chicago Comedy Festival, and they go, um, we're going to have people pitching on these three days, starting at the first pitch. And then uh, I, I knew where my, my level was in the comedy festival when they went, uh, there's the Brewers, the Yankees, the, and, the, and uh, there's the Brewers and the Yankees, right? And I go, oh, I'd like to do the Yankees. No, Louis already got that. <laughs> so I'll be doing the Brewers. Why did you even tell me? About the other? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why did you tell me there was another option that I'm not allowed? Yeah. Just, I would have been so happy if you just told me <laughs> yeah. you're throwing it at the... You know, but I've got the jersey that says Jeffries and everything. I don't wear it because I'm a Dodgers fan, but I like it. I've figured out, and I haven't done it. I'm, I might start doing it this year. If you're gigging around town, fucking, it's a lot of games, like 160 something. Games. What is it? 162. 62, right? 162 you games. You mean around the country? Yeah, you're gigging if you're on tour. Times that by all the fucking teams. There's like a thousand fucking. There's games. over two thousand games. Two thousand. Two thousand games, right? Two thousand games. There's not 2,000 celebrities, mate. No. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you, there's definitely not 162 of them in the Kansas or... Nope. You know what I mean? If you're gigging in Kansas, just ring them up. <laughs> You'll get to throw at the Royals. I've checked the Royals out. Sometimes they've got, like, Santa Claus doing it. <laughs> <laughs> or they, they've got, like... It's the summer Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah, very, got, very I'm unpopular I'm not character. Kidding. Santa Claus is trying to... Think, oh, my God. They'll have, like, the guy who sells tires. <laughs> Is throwing it. So I, although I failed. Local businessman Santa Claus throwing out the first pitch. Although I failed at the Cubs, I feel there's a field I can get this done. I think it would be Cleveland, hilarious if yeah. you did an actually a, a cricket I'm going to crush it motion Cleveland. instead of the actual. Yeah. Well, I'm anti calling teams the Indians as well. Are you? I do. I find yeah, that, that shocks the shit out of me. I find that offensive. <laughs> do you? Genocide of race, man. Yeah. Would you follow a soccer team called the Munich Jews? <laughs> I would. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you heard that, you go, oh, I don't call a soccer team that. You wouldn't want to see their mascot. No. You know what I mean? Like, I always think the chief wahoo is a little bit, woo, like, I don't know. Oh, no, it's, it's the Braves who are way more offensive with the chop. No, yeah. the Redskins, because the Redskins like a derogatory term. No, I agree, but now we're in a different sport. If we're strictly talking baseball, I think the nastiest thing is I'm, the chop. I'm against all genocided sporting teams. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, don't draw the line between baseball and football? I don't <laughs> limit it to this one. I, the very rare baseball team, the Moscow Kulaks. No, they never get mentioned. <laughs> the, the Kulaks never get a jersey in these things. Um, wait, what did Bill Murray do? Bill Murray did the safest thing. Mm. If you have any trepidation about reaching the catcher with the pitch, mm. he did a wind-up. He, he waved off a couple of signals mm. as to what pitch he would make, which I thought was hilarious. And then he did the pose, and then he did a big wind-up, and then turned to the side and threw it straight into the stands. 
this, this is the thing. That was fantastic. This crowd is, went crazy. This, this is the thing. With, with Legit, we did one where I went and threw a first pitch at the Quakes, which was sort of inspired by this. It was an episode where I threw the first pitch at a Quakes game, which is a... Um, the um, AAA, yeah, it's Minor, the, yeah, yeah. What's the name? What's the name? Chattanooga, not Chattanooga. Oh, Chattanooga. Um, no. Yeah, it's, no, it's on the outskirts of LA. Pachanga. It's Pachanga, whatever. Quakes, right? I don't think we've got that right. But anyway, so I was meant to throw the first pitch, <laughs> and then I had to fake the pitch, and we had a camera like ninety feet, sort of in between third and home. Right. And I was meant to like throw it, look that way, and then have it slip out my arm and like that, right? Hit the camera twice in a row. <laughs> and at 90 feet, if I'm not looking and I throw it at the side of my arm, I'm a fucking like yeah. zen master at yeah. this shit, right? Yeah. I'm seriously considering facing sideways. Yeah, throw to first. Yeah, and throwing to first and just watching it. <laughs> Strike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. That, like, <laughs> that would be extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you read reviews? I've got one from your Chicago uh, Just for Laughs show. I, I, I used to read reviews. Did I you read them in 2009? I read reviews of, when they're my, positive. of my television show. Oh, do you? I don't read the reviews because I, I really have a lot invested in it and I want it to do well. And also, if I find a review, I want to send it to the people who like people like the show. Please renew it. I want to do all that type of that stuff. That makes right? sense. Sure. Um, so I see that as a proactive thing in my career to read those reviews and also to find out which reviewers like the show so when we're at things with panels and stuff you can go up and say thank you for the great review just like not suck up but be nice to yeah. these people you know yeah. um but as for stand up uh, no no not anymore no, not really since the internet really took off when people were just so mean this one came from a uh, uh, chicago newspaper okay yeah did that go well from 2009 uh -huh. this is my first exposure to jeffries i missed his recent hbo special and I really liked him. Oh, he refrained from telling jokes or making observations, instead spinning very long, very elaborate stories that went to some incredibly dark and funny places. He may be as dark a comic as I've ever seen, but it didn't feel at all like a put-on. The darkness of Jeffrey's act was utterly sincere. I can't wait to see his career, where his career goes next. I just thought it was such a rare review that hit the center of, yeah. of the truth of it all. I'll tell you something about that show. That show, because it was Chicago, I was I only did a 40 minute set, and there was three comics doing a 40 minute set, and I'm not 100% sure if we sold out. Now that same theater I go back to now, and I sell it out for two nights. Right. Uh, the lineup in 2009 was me, Patrice O'Neill, and Louis C.K. Yes, it was. Wow. Yeah, and uh, Nick DiPaglia was right. emceeing, but the three guys doing the main, and uh, we, I'm not sure if we sold it out. I knew it was close. <laughs> but that, yeah, you and Louis C.K. would have no problem selling it out at this point. Yeah, yeah. And, and Patrice O'Neill would go through the roof. Right. But, you know, like now, of course, it's amazing. You know, but you put the three of us together now on a bill, you could sell a stadium. Right. Yeah, you're going to have a little difficulty getting Patrice there. I know. That's why we fill the stadium. Is that he's like Rodriguez <laughs> from that movie Searching Sugar Man. <laughs> like, like people are like, I thought he was dead. That's true. If you put his name on the bill, <laughs> people will assume people will they're going to see right. something very special. Yeah, right. they'll be like, someone found a cure for diabetes and death. <laughs> and death. Yeah. And yeah. Death. <laughs> oh man. Um. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, the, the, the deal is this. I mean, you were clearly inspired, uh, according to the research, uh, thank you, uh, Jason McIntyre, you were clearly inspired by the likes of uh, um, Eddie Murphy's uh, album. You talk, Delirious. Lot, you talk a lot about watching that and yeah. sort of feeling like that's the kind of comedy you wanted to do. But Carlin, too, in a huge way. Carlin, I was influenced by once I became a comedian. Right. And that was probably more influential on me once I figured out how difficult it was. And also, the things, everyone, whether it be a sport or acting or whatever, figures out little tricks that they're good at in life right. to get them by. And that was... Watching him was more, more influential to me, but watching Delirious was like watching porn. I just loved it. We had a Betamax copy, and I would sneak 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there. And for me, it was just, I wanted to be black so bad. 
like growing up in Australia, like I thought that was, he was just the coolest guy in the world. And also Australians don't say motherfucker. Even when I say it now, it sounds awkward. It's your N word. Oh, I say cunt like a champion, <laughs> but motherfucker doesn't, m motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> what about the... Shut up, you dumb motherfucker. What about See, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good. <laughs> You're not intimidated by that. No, really not. You make it sound so sweet. Well, it's, a, it's a boy fucking his mother. I think it's a disgusting term. Yeah, just like we <laughs> can't wrap our heads around the word cunt. Uh, well, you, see, can't, you know what the problem with the word cunt is with Americans? We is, don't understand that it means idiot to yeah, you. It, it just, and also, some guy can be a good cunt, and I'm going to meet my friend. Oh, he's such a cunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, you guys have it as a nasty word primarily that's said to women for some reason mm -hmm. and it doesn't really have any sort of female connotations like of course it has female connotations but I, I'd, I'd call men a cunt way before I'd call a woman a cunt well that so that's that would be our version of the word asshole oh, we use asshole as well yeah. oh, you know what I'm trying to bring up retro swear words that don't get used as much anymore. here we go let's you, start with you call someone a shithead right <laughs> They'll smile. <laughs> people, people have a shithead was so big when you were a kid. Oh, you're a shithead. Yeah. Right? You go, oh, shut up, you shithead. <laughs> Makes you laugh right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, people are, yeah, people are happy. You can say that to a person during a, a, a deal where you're trying to return a stereo, where they're just waiting for you to swear. Because then, because you know when you're dealing with customer service people, and they desperately want you to swear, so that so they can walk away, right? Because uh, until then, company policy is you have to calm the customer down and all that type of stuff. But if you swear, they go, oh, "I'm hanging this phone up right now. I don't need to be spoken to that way." And you're like, "Come on, you're a fucking adult. Like you've heard swear words. Right. You're, you're a 40 year old woman that works in a call center. <laughs> don't act like this is the first time someone's sworn at you. Like yeah. you can't. I once had a. This is God's honest truth. This is what amazed me about swear words. I was, dry, I, was, I was a barman, I was like 19 years old, um, working a weekend job as a barman, and I was driving home at about four in the morning. Um, I was still living with my parents. I was driving back to their house, and I go past a house, and a fucking tree's on fire. The power cords or something's happened. This tree's on fire, and it's right near this family's house. This house is about to be on fire. Everyone in the house is asleep. They don't know it. They don't know it. And it's like burning all around the front of the house. So I run under this burning tree. I bang, bang, bang on the door. I get this family out, right? And this family's like, oh, thank God, blah, 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 thanking me. I ring our equivalent of 911, which in Australia is 000 kids. If you're watching on the net, don't mix it up. <laughs> and uh, and so, which I always found stupid because it won the old dial phones. That's the longest one. You're like, oh, I've got an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> I hope, I hope this rape ends soon. <laughs> <laughs> right? So anyway, I rang him up and I went, Hi, there's, there's a fire. There's a fire. And I'm on the corner of, uh, fuck, I don't know, like that. And the lady went, if you keep swearing at me, young man, I'll hang the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you dragged a family to safety. And I'm like, you have a fucking emergency. And boom, the phone goes up. Ah, shit. Got to ring it again. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. I, was on my, I had a mobile by that stage. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Although, someone bring those back, please. Give me a, a rotary on a oh, mobile phone. How many hipsters would love a mobile that was a rotary? Right? That would do something. You'd sell a billion. And then so you there must be an app. There already must be an app, you of course. You stick like a little phone book on the back so you can check your phone. <laughs> there we go. Let's people, let's, let's all the, everything retro. My mother still carries a phone book. No, no. In her thing and then pulls out a phone. By her thing, do you mean her bra? Where are you going? Uh, a pocket oh, or okay. whatever. Right. She, she carries a lot of things in her tits. <laughs> She's a, she's a big woman. My mother uses, my mother uses, her tits when she's sitting on a lazy boy are a perfect flat shelf. Oh, for like a soda? For like plates of food. She right. just sits in, straight in the tits. Like she went through a phase when she was younger of having that tray that had the little bean bag underneath it. Sure. That you would sit on your lap and you'd go, all right. And it had the little ridge so that nothing fell out the sides. Right. Yeah, but now she's just moved up to straight to tits. <laughs> That's pretty great. Which is what I'm going to, when I give a eulogy at a funeral one day, that's what I'm going to say. She had a great set of table tits. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> She'll be so proud. Yeah, yeah. We have her on Skype. <laughs> go, oh, I've let's said, go. I, the horrible things I said about my mum, and 
Well, that's the thing. I, the, the research shows that there have been some feedback from the family over the years. Yeah, you, you have research. Yeah, yeah, your dad at some point now likes to stand up. My dad. Or did. My dad stands he up. He stood up at a few shows. Hello. Yeah. Still Hello. Talking about yeah, yeah. me. Um, my my mother. Uh, your brother took a while to come around. My, okay, my eldest brother still doesn't quite get it, but he he, he comes on. He's a cop. Right. You know, and he brings his cop friends, and he's sort of like the sergeant, so they all sort of sit there. And he's from the SWAT team, so they're all steroid bound cops. <laughs> <laughs> like they're full on, like just, just they're all bunched in in the front row. <laughs> And uh, and yeah, he doesn't he doesn't super get it. My other brother kind of digs it because Scotty, who get, who who is in a lot of my routines, um, I think to begin with, the people at work were giving him shit. But then once I became more popular, people right. were like, it's "Jim Jeffy's brother." Yeah, that's right. You that's know what exactly I mean? So right. he got more kudos off the whole things. But when I wasn't that successful, he was a bit irked by the whole right. thing. Now you're a closer for him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My my dad um, doesn't mind it, but my mother says things. She says the only way I make a living is by making fun of her. Right. And she's uh, I won't say affectionately. No, she can't come to the shows anymore because I have a routine. Um, probably my, one of my most popular routines is talking about my mother being called Gunter. And because we went to the Moscow Circus when I was seven and there was an elephant called Gunter and the circus master used to go up, Gunter, up. And the whole routine based around my brother once standing in front of my mother's chair and saying up, Gunter, up. And it's, that's the only routine that occasionally I'll repeat. I don't repeat any of my other stuff on my, on my disc, but if they start yelling out routines, they want me to do, I'll do that one and then I'll let the audience say the punchline all at once and they you know they get a thrill out of it sure. i guess but but if my mother shows up she's a big woman with an oxygen mask with a cane and everyone's yelling gunter they're calling gunter to her so it's just it's just a bit awkward really to have it there plus i had her in an audience once and i could just see it and i broke out in sweat just like piles of it was coming out of me the panic of having my mother in the room wow. was, was too much yeah i don't like to see anyone i know anyone i know I don't, I don't mind having the occasional, uh, you know, yeah, I don't mind friends and mostly family, but my mother I can't handle. My dad, my dad, I don't like it when my dad brings his friends because I feel like, what if they don't like it? I could embarrass him in front of his friends. Oh, that's interesting. Because he, his, he, all of his friends are old blokes as well, and they're all in a, they're in a lawn bowls club. Sure. You don't play lawn bowls here. We have one in Santa Monica that we we see on occasion, right in, there on Wilshire. In Australia, very serious. In Australia, it's every suburb, every neighbourhood, every sort of five blocks has their own bowling. It's game. not a waste of valuable property at all. I'll tell you what. What the old cunts do in this country? My dad does that every day. Yeah. What is the thing? Because it's a very gentle sport. It's actually a very technical sport and very hard sport. There's nothing on the joints or whatever like that. Right. And but he goes there to and have, they're all dressed up nice to have two pints of lager, and then he bowls a game. And a game lasts like three hours. Are they? Is he in a special outfit? Oh yeah, the white outfit with the hat. He's yeah. got a special badge that See, says no, that's he's, great. A, that I love. he's a member of that club and everything. Right. And people say they play golf, but I feel I rang up a friend the other day because I was, you know, whenever I think of not drinking, I think maybe I should take up golf. And I rang up my friend, and, go, am I, and he was a good golfer. And I said, am I too old to take up golf? And he went, yes. <laughs> but this is the time, this is, no, you know, you're supposed to take it up in your 50s. No, you know what I mean? You meant to take it up younger than that so you can get good at well, it. Well, if you're going to, if you have any plans of being great, but if you want to have leisurely I, time. I, I don't see why, I always think, like. It's a sport of leisure. I've never been good at any single sport, ever, not even close. And so I often think to myself, why would I be good at this one? But then there's a little bit of your ego in your brain that goes, maybe you're a natural. This will be... It is one of those sports, actually, that does offer the natural concept pretty well because it's all about a swing that has its own timing, and you either have it or you don't. It's very similar to comedy timing, if, I'm, if I must. So you're saying I'd be an excellent golfer? Yes. I am saying that. <laughs> we start tomorrow. Good. That's, that's, that's saved me a lot. Of, oh, I don't think I have to. I think I can retire from golf right now knowing that I've achieved all my goals. <laughs> um, well, you know, let's talk about those days, those salad days of... Um, you were kind enough to be in the documentary that I've talked about a few times here, The Misery Loves Comedy. Mm. But, but you, you spoke about in that, the time when, you mentioned briefly here, when you were 17, you did a couple of shows that went horribly. Yeah. One of which your father drove you to and was witness to. Yes. And said on the way home, the, the, quote... This is probably not for you. Right. Yeah, yeah, this. <laughs> yeah it's beautiful. But I mean, he sort of said things like, you're good at other things. But like he tried to say it nicely. It was so loving yeah, when he said I, it. I, now, as a father 
myself, I see that I would probably say the same thing to my son. If It's being protective. Like yeah, yeah, I, like this is, uh, what he was basically saying is this is only going to bring you misery. You don't need to suffer through this. Yeah. <laughs> don't let him have it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That must have broke his heart when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I, I died really, really badly. And my father doesn't express emotions super super well but he said something the other day i was out in australia i was doing a zombie movie in australia and uh, uh my parents came to visit and then uh my dad said he was in my mo hotel room and as he was walking to the bathroom because uh, i'd just done carnegie hall like a few months earlier mm -hmm. and my father went ha one of my sons doing carnegie hall who would have thought and that was about as much that i was like Wow, he's really impressed by that. Yeah. Because to begin with, when I first told him, I was in Australia when I found out I was doing Carnegie Hall. And I said, Dad, I want to fly you out to do this show. I'm doing Carnegie Hall. And then my dad had just seen me in the theatre the night before, and he went, I've seen your show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I went, and I went. Yeah, but I'm, I'm doing Carnegie Hall. And he said, Will it be the same material that I just saw? <laughs> I said, Well, it's only four months ago, so it'll probably be very similar material. Yes. Oh, maybe if you had new stuff, I don't know. <laughs> That's so fucking beautiful. That is. Well, listen. Um, it's only because you've uh, been around and climb the ladder of American show business that you're able to appreciate Carnegie Hall. What could Carnegie sure. Hall possibly fucking mean in Australia? Sitting well, the house. fuck, he has the internet. Um, no, no, but seriously. Yeah, no. I mean, I, when you grow up here. Well, the thing is, I, I'm doing shows, I'm doing Five Nights in Sydney coming up, and I'm just at a place called the Enmore Theatre, which is a very nice theatre. I'm not putting the theatre down. It's a beautiful old theatre. Um, but, but it's when, not the when Opera I, House. But, but the, I can't do the Opera House. It's too small. And Bingo was his name of. There yeah, is. you know what I mean? The Opera House, I couldn't sell enough tickets in. And, and not, this theater's bigger, and I'm doing it for five nights. I'm not going to the Opera House. What the fuck? <laughs> and take, I also, take a cut and pay? I also, I also learned, I also learned from How many Carnegie Hall that I probably won't do Carnegie Hall again either. And the reason is because you can go to the Beacon and the audience can get drunk. I can't even carry a drink on stage. It's not a water or anything because there's special floors and the... You know what I mean? Fuck that. Yeah, and it's like... And now you've done it. I want the audience to be... And it's like, can we have some lights going like this as I walk out? No. no. Like, I know the stagehands there earn more than Obama. Like, this is like the classic thing. They yeah. earn more than the president to be a stagehand. Yeah. They don't do anything. <laughs> no, no, that's... I, I walked out on stage... That's called New York Union. I friend. walked out on stage, and there was, I always have a chair on stage, and I went, oh, actually, I'll put that chair a bit further back. And it's, as I went to move it, they freaked the fuck out. Yeah. No, 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 that's no, fucking Ted's job. <laughs> you cannot move a stool. Yeah, yeah, so this guy came out and looked at me like, you're trying to get us all fucking fine? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah, he moved it a bit back. Like, this is obviously an easy day for him. Sometimes he's got the philharmonic and all these different chairs yeah, that have just to go one, one guy. It's funny, I, I, they said, they said, oh, you know what, I wanted to take photos in there. No cameras, no cameras, no cameras. The second I walk out on stage, it's like when Elvis came on in Vegas. Oh, all right. All these flashes, like that, uh, but I'm not allowed to take a fucking photo. So I've got a few sneaky pictures because I brought my son out there and he actually started walking two days later. Jesus. Um, and I could sense that he was getting close. And I thought, come on, walk on Carnegie Hall. So I had that little story that you walked on the stage at Carnegie Hall was your first steps. The little fucker wouldn't. Uh, oh. Well, got, you can rub that in his face. Yeah, oh yeah, the disappointment. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, broke your old man's heart. The, the, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah he's, a, he's not a bad... It's very interesting at the moment. He's, uh, he's So he's almost 17 months, and it's basically a word a day we're getting. Yeah? He might, he might say a word for two days and then forget about it. Cuss word yet? Uh, no, I, I have, there's a rumor going around that he said shit. A rumor. Yeah, but I haven't seen it. And if I haven't seen it, then it didn't it's fucking not happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's like there's a rumor there's a god. <laughs> yeah. Right? But I haven't seen him, so therefore he's not real. Right? right. But um, he... Yeah, I, I saw him... I, I saw something great. I saw his first sentence the other day because there's a little girl down the road that plays with him. And, and he ran into her and she fell over. And he went, I'm sorry. Whoa! Yeah, right, right. It's only two words. Still a sentence, though. And I didn't know he knew the word sorry, but he used it in the right, right context. I'm sorry. And everyone lost their shit like, yeah! <laughs> yeah! And you know what he took from that? People clap when I push girls on the ground. <laughs> oh, Damn right. Shit! 
goddamn right. Right? So for the rest of the day, he's just pushing her over. Like, him. Oh my god. And you're like, no, we, were, a we, human were, we were so excited about what you did right after that. <laughs> You know, mm. dear fucking Lord, did he use an apostrophe and you guys lost your shit? Lost our <laughs> shit. I'm sorry. Yeah. Because he hears me say that so much to his mother. Sure. And so that's like <laughs> yeah, a yeah. sentence that's heavily used. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll share with him one day, as you have with total strangers, I, that I, the first time he used that with his mother was at his conception. I don't... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have a chance of being a good parent. I don't because? Well, I want to be a good parent, and I have all the will and the needs to be a good parent. Desire. And desire to be a good parent. It's just, at the moment, it's not. there's no parenting. It's just suicide watch. If for the first year to two years, it's just, hey, you'll die. <laughs> don't do that. Don't? Yeah, like, you get to the back of the couch and tries to die. You'll break your neck, and you'll end up in a little tiny wheelchair. We don't want that. <laughs> right? And so, you know, I've never seen a baby in a wheelchair, but I assume they exist. <laughs> I've never seen it. Do people only ever, like, can't babies break their necks? I'm sure they do. I'm sure there's someone right now crying their eyes. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Of course, babies break their necks, but I've never seen a seven, baby. A seven-month-old? My guess is if a seven-month-old suffered a broken neck, that's... It's pretty much that. Yeah, but have you seen it? You put it down, Sam? It would be a wheelchair I, this big. I I've never seen I one. Feel, it's got it like a it's like a bed, maybe not a chair. It's oh, like a, like a they, stroller. If, if it's a little, or, or do they strap him up like Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> on the hand there it is. Yeah, and push him around the on, the, on the trolley. Yeah. <laughs> this it. one's a biter. Um, no, I... I <laughs> this one's a biter. But, love, love the shoes. But the thing is, so at the moment, parenting parenting's easy. People ask me, Stuart, are you a good parent? And I'm like, who do, I don't know. You want suicide watch? You know, I'm just stopping him from dying. Right. But when he gets to an age where I have to give him advice... Uh-oh. There's six hours of DVD footage of me saying the most horrible things in the world. Right. So it's very hard for me to go, hey, don't take drugs because drugs aren't fun and no one's had fun put that pint down yeah don't drink <laughs> yeah. you're acting like an idiot try to respect women right right <laughs> try i should just say respect women <laughs> he's got so much footage of me saying the most horrible shit that Truly. i that i only sometimes 50 percent mean or don't mean at all i'm just trying to get a laugh and so I don't know what I'll do. I really, I really stay up a little bit at night thinking about it. I won't say all night, but I just in the late at night, I go... Oh. I think the fact that you think about it at all is encouraging. Yeah. To his future. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, that's... A, uh, my, my other big concern is... Unless it's just about you being judged. Because, you. because I've made money. I'm not super rich, but i got, I got money now, you know, and I grew up very poor, and it's how do you make him not a cunt? That's right. If you've got money. That's the big one. By the way... Best-selling book, Automatic, if that's the title. Don't make your kids cunts. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just me with, like, a kid behind me that's just got really odd, like, shitty shoes. And going, <laughs> why is Dad driving a Ferrari and I'm wearing these shit shoes? <laughs> Don't give him anything. But, but I know what you mean by that. Yeah. You're, that, that your task and your mind and your thoughts and your heart is how do I just make sure he has a work ethic? I think about it all day. First of all. All day is what I think about. Because the generation that are being called millennials right now, mm. uh, which will be old people to him when he's 20, yeah. um, are already the laziest cunts that ever lived. <laughs> I've been thinking, what's the best, what's the best job yeah, for... Right? You got a little Samantha Ward out of you. No, what's no, no, the... that, was a, that wasn't a cackle. <laughs> what's the best job for a 15-year-old? I think that. I drive around and I go, because I, I work at McDonald's, you don't want grease, because grease is horrible. No one deserves to be covered in grease. Right. Right, so cut out Burger King, Carl's Jr., all that sort of stuff. I've decided that when you're 15, the two best jobs you can get are ice cream parlor. Mm-hmm. Good for your forearms. <laughs> as long as you don't eat the merchandise. Well, yeah. Never yeah. seen a 15 year old ice cream pro that wasn't covered in zits, though. Yeah, true. But, you know. Same thing with the fryer. That's a good way to stop you from being cunt, zits. <laughs> <laughs> zits can humble you. Um, and, then, uh, and then Cinnabon. Oh. Just, just being around a nice smell. If, <laughs> if, if, if you can. If you can stay away from the merchandise and not become fat, Cinnabon's cushy because when you get to the till, what is it, like four buttons at a Cinnabon? They're just... 
<laughs> there's not too much to learn. Because right. there's only four choices? Yeah, yeah. All you can get is a Cinnabon. There's an extra icing button that you might have to hit. Is there? Yeah, there'd be because that's a dollar more. Dude. Who, what fat cunts eat the extra icing? <laughs> how, 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 when you go to cinema and you go extra extra icing, just fucking call it a day. I, once I think made most that. people do get the extra icing. I made that mistake oh, once when know. you made what was the thing you made and I had the icing in the fucking. Oh, I think it was. Oh, was oh it? no, it was a cake. I made a cake, but it was just like a box cake, and then I had the extra like the leftover like chocolate icing. And I thought it'll be a good idea to keep that later, so when I eat the cake, I'll make sure there's icing on every bite. What and you the? made yourself. Yeah, exactly. So sick in three bites. This is I'm against new cupcakes. When I was old, cupcakes were small. Yep. And they just had you put a knife into the icing and you went like that over the top. You might put some sprinkles or hundreds and thousands, as we call them in Australia. Oh, is that right? Yeah, hundreds of thousands. We have That's another we have another kid thing at kids' parties that we call fairy bread, which is just white bread, buttered. Mm -hmm. Covered in hundreds of thousands. You eat it. It's a very sweet thing to eat. Sprinkles in Australia are called hundreds of thousands because. There's hundreds and thousands of them, isn't there? No, yeah. <laughs> Did you not pick up on that? That's why. Maybe if yeah. you filled a mountain. No, there seems to be a lot of them. In yeah. a cup. If, if, Where if, I come if, from in Western Pennsylvania, they're called Jimmy's. 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 Well, Jimmy's, I've heard. There's yeah. a lot of Jimmy's in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, hundreds of thousands. So, so anyway, so you, you put, you get a knife, you put the icing on. Yep. And that's it. I don't, I don't want people to think this is a routine, by the way, because I'm not about to say anything funny. <laughs> and But now, cupcakes have a, a swirly man on the top. A swirly man? Yeah, well, they have, you know, like a soft serve sure. version of icing at the top, and you're meant to bite, and then. Like, now it's on your face? I know the icing's a bit more sort of whipped. Yeah. And a bit more. It's not even icing. Yeah, it's cream cheese. The ratio's off. The ratio's off. And I it's was like, having this discussion recently. It's yeah, like it we're meant to be going, and, and you just know it's just some bubbly chick who just. I want to open a cupcake store. And it's, 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 it's visually, <laughs> yeah. visually, it's outstanding. But when you bite into it, your nose has got a bit of icing on the end. That's why you got to make the cupcake, cupcake sandwich. sandwich. You got to take cupcake. the cake off the bottom and squish you it. Cut on it top. in half. So you help the Long bottoms. ways. Yeah. And, and then that? you and then you have a top for the cupcake. Tell me what's the sandwich. difference between that and a muffin? Is a muffin just a bit bigger? Muffin um, they try to muffin. sell as breakfast. Yeah. Right. A muffin was made with you know bran. Hopefully, yeah, it used the to be cupcake good. You'd have like apple cake. chunks in it. But no, no. At work, to yeah. I and uh, when I'm filming a TV show. I have a chocolate chip muffin in the morning. That's healthy. First thing I do. And then Dan Bacadol, if you watch him that through the season, the fuck, he gained some weight. He grows year, up. Right? <laughs> because we should ban donuts. He can't resist them. We have Krispy Kremes just there, and he's, and like towards the end, you can sort of see him like hiding behind his trailer in shame. How, you know what you should do? <laughs> you should get him season two of Boston Legal and watch. tell him to watch James Spader blow up like a poisoned dog. <laughs> <laughs> from craft service. And if you're on an hour drama, can you imagine? One of the leads in Sunny got fat for one season. But he did that on purpose. No, no, he did it on purpose. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He fucking fat nailed mask. it. But by the way... <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, that was an accomplishment because it was by season six or seven and he just said, wouldn't it be funny if my character was suddenly fatter than fat fat by the time we start shooting again, and he did it knowing that he would lose it the weight again for the following season. I mean, uh, that was crazy. I read an interesting, yeah. he did like a mini article, probably in Entertainment Weekly about it too, like about how he was trying to like gain weight healthy, and then he'd just be like, ah, fuck it, I'm just gonna eat McDonald's. Yeah. And, but, yeah. It must have been fun, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, if I gain, because I go up and down sort of 15 pounds, like in the span, and I'm talking like in a month, <laughs> I'll gain 15, and I'll lose like eight of them in a month. Well, I can gain 15 in a month, no fucking problem. Really? I just, I, even like tomorrow I might be five pounds heavier. It's just, I don't know <laughs> about me. I, and then sometimes people are like, wow, he's really good looking. And then someone's like, oh my God, this guy's like the most horrible. I, I can go the whole Puffy. thing. <laughs> now... <laughs> I, my agent rang me up yesterday. Did he? To about a, there's a there's a uh, Tina Fey uh, movie coming up. All right. I, I can't say too much. Obviously, this is sure in the works. And in the works. And they said, uh, she go, he goes, there's a part for you. I think there's a part that, that we could get you. We we can definitely get you to read for it. This part's perfect for you. He's like. Uh, like he, he used to be the guy in school who was like good looking and Everyone now he's wanted to fuck him. Now he's just like this fat slob. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's my agent ringer. Now so do you think you can play a fat slob? <laughs> 
Jesus. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that out of the realms. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then he goes, he goes, because uh, you know, you probably were good looking back in the day, and oh I was God. like, "This is the agent you want." I was like, "You could have sold me back in the day." I always think that. I've always been this funny, but I used to be good looking, and it's only now that people consider me for acting roles. Oh my God! Back in the day, I could have destroyed it. <laughs> <laughs> All my glory years are behind me. They never, I never even had an audition in my glory years. <laughs> Uh, I think that says a lot about your talent, mister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I, all I know is there's never been a call sheet that goes, the part we want is a overweight, thinning, pale Australian. Have you got anyone on your books like that? <laughs> no. That's never been the character description. Pale Australian? <laughs> Give it another year. The yeah. Aussies are taking over this town. We've been we've taken over a long time ago. I know. You don't even know it's happened. Yeah. It's, <laughs> You did. You snuck in. It wasn't until last year you looked at every network television show, every pilot. Yeah. It's all Aussies playing Americans in the league. Speaking leagues. of giant... And uh, that good-looking bird off the Wolf of Wall Street. Holy yeah. shit. She was something, huh? Yeah. She's Australian. This is the weird thing, because if you want an Australian bird, get them young. Is that right? <laughs> I, and I'm not, I'm not anti the older woman. My girlfriend's a few years older than me, right? I'm not anti... Right? Gotcha. But Australian women, you, you got to get them before, I'm saying 26. I see. After that, the sun has affected them in a horrible way. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, they are wallet-like creatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been away from Australia, not living there for years and years. I go back to, oh, I wonder how Mandy is. She was a good-looking girl. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> and then she's what about Mandy, who's greeted by men like shit. that on a regular basis? She's hey, oh god! <laughs> and it's also, it's also like no one smokes down there or anything. It's like, oh no, we don't smoke. We, you know, we take care of ourselves. And you know, I like to exercise in the sun, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> so by 27, they're an endangered I, species. I will take a 40 cigarette day of habit over the Australian sun for your skin. <laughs> is that right? No fuck! I'm not kidding. It's the number one killer in Australia is skin cancer. Is it right? And like the same way that you have all those smoking commercials, lung cancer, this, yeah. Although I feel with the smoking commercials now, I'm going off track again. That's quite all right. That's the smoking commercials, they're just bitching too much, mm. right? That now, too much is nothing. There's a saying, too much is nothing. It's like my mother used to yell every day and it became like white noise to me, right? right? If you just kept on plowing, if the cigarette people just kept on going, lung cancer, lung cancer, lung every smoker is afraid of lung cancer. That's the big one. But then when they, they have that advert with like the person who's lost a foot. <laughs> I've never met a cunt who's lost his foot. I'm sure it happens, <laughs> right? But I'm sure there's people, who have, more people have lost their foot drinking Coca-Cola. Is that right? Yeah, if diabetes, you'll lose a foot like fucking that. <laughs> right? Yeah. We don't have any of these, hey, I used to drink a can of Coke every day and he's like putting his bloody new foot on. <laughs> right? Don't try to fucking scare me with the foot. Yeah. Well, when they're missing half their neck and they're talking through the box. And then they've got that, that one, that, the, the fucking, yeah, the box one's scary. The lower but the one where the, the girl now, she's like, um, pack of cigarettes, please. Mm -hmm. And they go, how much will that be? And then she goes, six ninety nine or something. She hands the money over and she goes, you know I want more, and she's like, oh. and she just peels half her face off. I've like, not seen this. Yeah, and she goes, <laughs> and then they go, what, what does smoking really cost you? Oh, wow. Well, the answer is six ninety nine. You know, <laughs> you know, like she's going to get more wrinkles from fucking drinking all night and uh, boozing and not sleeping. Is really going to be, you know, I, I always look look at these old actors that smoke all the time. Like Sinatra never looked bad. Puffy, he got puffy. Oh yeah, that wasn't booze gets yeah. you puffy. That's why I'm talking about the five pounds. I'll okay? get all alcohol. I've I, I bought these tablets in Mexico that you can take to piss things out. I took one of them once. I won't do it ever again. I pissed like a racehorse <laughs> for like 12 hours, <laughs> but at the end of it, I looked gaunt. <laughs> I was like, no, the first thing that goes on a serious diet is water weight, and you can't believe because it asks you to drink more water than you normally would. Yeah, yeah. And you're actually losing four pounds in water weight. And you, you, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, it's it's like if you take one of these tablets, you lose the four pounds in a day. Yeah. And you'll just be because the Mexicans, God bless them, they um. I went on a cruise and we stopped off one day in Mexico, and their their pharmacies. 
They're not taking things seriously down there. <laughs> Why, what do you mean by that? Well, at the front, at the front, they've got a guy with like a thing going Xanax, fucking lots of oxycotton, piss tablets. Like he's just these are dangerous. What is this move? He's got the stick. He's got the same thing that Fred Phelps had that said God hates fags. One of those sticks. Big sign. I, I want to talk about Fred Phelps, please. <laughs> I, I am not homophobic in any way. I think that man was the most despicable human that possibly ever lived. I, also, the West is Baptist Church. We're, yeah, of course. West, West Borough Baptist Church. What if, this is weird, what if, and I'm an atheist, there is a God, and Fred Phelps was the only one that was right. That means he's the only guy that was getting into heaven. Wow. No one else is getting it because he was so strict. <laughs> No one else kept up to his standards. Right, of course. That meant that he's just, it's just him and God just sitting up in heaven going, Fuck them. You're the only one who understood me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Want to talk about how much we hate gays? Sure do. <laughs> that was my main agenda. You're the only one who understood me. <laughs> sure do. Why is my wife not up here? Ah, uh, she once got her hair cut by a homosexual man. Ah, well, it deserves that then. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Someone on the staff was uh, quoting one of your bits earlier about the uh, the baptism, the baptism. Oh, uh, so God, God was I mean, saying you don't put the thing in the baby. If in you there. don't put, yeah, God's, God loves you very much. Is that the God that you the people believe in is the one? Yes, but that's the reason that you baptize a child is, and this is the reason you, you christen or baptize or whatever you want to call it, is because um, if that child dies before it can join the church normally it is held by God so it can get into heaven right um, because because God tries to recruit people who can't talk you can't get you can't get a driver's license can't do anything but you can be your eternal destiny can be decided at your birth and because uh, God loves you, sure, but He has to have some rules, right? <laughs> you know, if He lets one dead baby in, then He has to let all the dead babies in, and before you know it, heaven's just filled. You wouldn't be able to move for dead babies. <laughs> so I haven't said that for years. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was always it was always funny because God was walking around just kicking things out, like, oh fucking hell, we got a lot of these things. Yeah. I I yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty great. Yeah, I, the, what was one of the worst moments in my stand-up career was telling that joke where I actually, it was funny, but it was also someone missing the point, but also hurting someone so deeply that I, I actually wanted to give this person a hug. What happened was... Yeah, it was, what are you talking about? It was someone who obviously lost a child to, to cot death. Ah! And I, although my... Although at no stage do I condone dead babies or want there to be dead babies. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of, of a church that says they love you, yet you have to put water on the child's forehead. So, but obviously... The, yeah, what the, made me laugh about the joke was that you were saying to the audience, is that the God that you believe yeah. in? The one who says, no, no, you didn't put the thing on the baby and the baby's not coming. Yeah, exactly. So I feel it's... And how could this parent... I feel, I feel like my routine is was pro not dead baby <laughs> that's the stance i have by the way um, if it wasn't clear before yeah, yeah, my, it should be now i would like you all to know watching at home that i believe dead babies are wrong in many cases um the dead babies themselves are wrong in many cases yeah. like, look, of course exceptions to the rule sometimes you get one that cries too much that needs a good shake <laughs> anyway so so there's uh, this lady just cried and went, you would never say that if you had a dead child and she's in the room. And obviously the room went... Uh, silent. Went silent. You had a heckler who said those words. Yeah, and with tears in her eyes. And I, I tried... Up? Yeah, stood up. Oh, and, I, and I sort of went, look, I'm not trying to... I'm sorry about... And then and like some people, oh, fuck you, people were yelling. I'm like, hey, please. Because obviously this person was in an emotional state that I didn't want to... I was like, just please. And then she storms out of the room. And, and we, we, we were in, I think we were in Newcastle, England, which, which, where they have the best accent of them all. You know, Newcastle, why I man? You know, it's, it's really up and down type of language. And the, and the guy, and she's a very good looking woman who did this. And then one, one guy stood up, he goes, to be fair, mate, she was fucking fit. Which fit is like sexy, right? She goes, she was fucking fit. And, <laughs> and then another guy said, because we, we didn't know the baby died young or whatever, he goes, he goes, another guy said, when they don't carry him to term, 
They keep their figures. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> was... Oh my god. So your audience and patient. And I'm there was... going, oh god. <laughs> He's like, that's such a good joke. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. But I still feel for that woman, but I still rejoice how smart that joke was that the other man said. So, <laughs> so what happens is, in your live shows, which yeah. people didn't know, yeah. occasionally, because you like to go to the dark side, as sure. we talked about before, it's important to you to have that sort of honesty and truth on stage yep. and to have these thoughts and to share them openly and your devotion to them. Occasionally, a discussion will break out among the audience. Sure. Where one, the heckles are really a debate on what's being said. I have found over the years that, that, that uh, comedy crowds self-police. Yeah. For the most part. At the moment, now I do have, because I had another person, I, I, was, I was famously someone uh, punched me on stage at the Manchester Comedy Store. It's in the notes here. Yeah. Because uh, uh, my favorite part of the entire experience was you getting on stage whenever thereafter with yeah. film of it behind you, stopping and starting the, the YouTube yeah. thing <laughs> and commenting on where you were at emotionally and where the... I mean, that part was fucking spectacular. Well, it's happened again recently. Because now they think it's... Is it like copycat? No, there was, there was a guy that uh, just... I was in Al Albany on this particular tour I'm on right now and a guy came on ran on stage I said thank you very much good night no hints of anything and a guy came running towards us he jumped up and he got tackled by the sound technician actually that was or the stage before he could reach you yeah and I was off chatting to my support act and then I just you fucking bully like that it was dragged away and I've been, I, I had my head fractured in Nottingham uh, John Lewis, which is a comedy chain like the improv in England a guy smashed my head into a table um, and that one I was worried during about. During the show, no. After the show, just and, but not during an argument. I was just chatting, talk, talking to another comedian. He came up after and just bang. Cold cocktail. Yeah, and lights out. You know that that one uh, hit the table and it fractured there because your skull. That's the softest bit. If your head gets whacked, it normally fractures there. And then I uh, came too very close and I was like, ah, fine. I was a tough guy and went back to the hotel and. Uh, had headaches like I thought my brain was hemorrhaging like oh wow this is is it and I went to the hospital and bless the uh, British healthcare I'm a I'm a big advocate for public health care uh, I went in under the name Jim Jeffries didn't show my ID or anything like that they kept me in there for three four days under under monitoring and then they left and they I didn't sign a single bit of paper and I was a uh, wasn't a British citizen I was just there on a visa from Australia I could have been a legal immigrant they would have fixed me and uh, it was pretty good. That's when I, pretty when, extraordinary. When, yeah. When I <laughs> you, you know who doesn't like hearing those stories? British citizens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I tell they you. they have to pay for that with the taxes. Well, n yes and no, but... There's I, tremendous I, pride I, in this. I, yeah, I, social I medicine. paid a lot of taxes in, in the UK, so I'm not going to... Oh, no, fair enough. Yeah, and, um, but also in, a, in Australia, the, the system's even better in Australia, but Australia's... Uh, I don't want to get too political about it. Australia is very good at healthcare because there's only 22 million. That's yeah. right. And, and 22 control. million people are a very manageable thing to do yeah. in comparison to 330 million or yeah. whatever it is here. Um, and it's a bit harder in Britain. There's a bit more protocol you have to go through. But in Australia, there's like 24-hour clinics. And everyone gets given like a credit card where you just walk in, you just swipe it as you go in, and then they, they have your whole medical history, and off you go. Yeah. And it's it's pretty brilliant. But uh, here, I, I look, I've got good health care, so what do I give a fuck for? I just think it's the right thing. Uh, getting back to the knockout punch mm -hmm. on stage. Well, that wasn't a knockout punch. That was, not, that was the one that was off stage. The one on stage just went ding, little tiny hit. Yeah, Actually, he was, barely touched it. Was it. This one. it looks good. He's at full extension yeah. and I had a little tiny crescent moon sort of bruise on the side of my head. Right. And it was... Uh, but I do love, the, like I said, the way you got up with the footage behind you on a large screen and, and broke down each moment. It's also an opportunity to sort of self-deprecate, yeah, yeah. here I am cowering, and this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's all from a performer standpoint, wonderfully choreographed. But the truth of the matter is, you took the piss out of it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, yeah, I... I people had asked me so much about it that I figured I had to do something. I couldn't ignore that this happened. And it's funny, every now and again, I'll be in a motel room or a hotel room, 
and I'll turn on and I, I did an interview for it years and years ago for like I, I'm, th I'm gonna say CNN mm -hmm. right and it's like it's like uh, when audiences go wild. Oh my God. One of those shows, right? I'm on one of these shows. And so it always finishes with some guy going, so next time you're at a baseball game, a, a comedy club, be more careful. Maybe it's better just to stay home. Oh my and God. And then it's always the footage of me being punched. And then the dr when you put the dramatic music on it, <laughs> like this guy didn't know what was going on and all that. Then it's like way more scary. Like fucking hell, man. <laughs> Yeah, but when you were there live, it it was sort of exciting. I, I remember, I remember just the crowd going bananas. I went through a little door at the back after he hit me, and I'm sitting there. And now there was a guy called Michael McIntyre sitting at the back, and Michael McIntyre is the tickets-wise the biggest comedian in the world now, but he wasn't back then. He's a stadium-filling guy in the UK. In the UK. I've never heard of him. And through Australia and all that stuff. He's sort of like a Seinfeld esque sort of comedian. Right. Um, what is the deal with. Yeah. yeah he, he sort of speaks like this. He speaks very quickly and goes, oh, You've got a mug. And uh, why do they call it a mug? And then when you put your face in a certain way, they say you're mugging. He does, he does that type of stuff, right? <laughs> he can, he'll, he'll do that all day. Right? I'm, so, I'm yeah. sensing just a tinge of dismissiveness. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. no. I actually. This is what I say about Michael. I quite like Michael. He's had TV show. Everyone says they like Michael now because he can make you famous. But he wasn't the most popular guy in the dressing room back in the day. He was arrogant and, but may I say, he's proven everyone wrong. Right. He was the, he's become the biggest comic in the world, so he had every reason to be arrogant, right? But Michael said something that I was... When you uh, went back I, I still it. think it's so funny, because he was watching it on the TV. In the dressing room. And, and he's since told me that, that what he did was, once he heard I was coming back, he changed the channel very quickly. Mm. Right? Wow. So he was watching the whole thing, like obviously standing up going, oh my God, like that. Once he saw that I'd left and had to go down the tunnel to the dressing room, he got back, he sat in, and then he's just watching like some soap on TV like this. And I've come in, and I'm all shaken, I've got a black eye on <laughs> and, and he goes, how did it go? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, not good, Michael, not good. Someone, someone just punched me in the head. And he went, <laughs> no one can follow me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, like, he's one of those funny guys where he's just like, I'm going to get a fucking a dig in here, yeah. no matter what. Yeah, made you laugh in that crucial moment. Uh, no, I was, no, I don't know if I did laugh. I just sort of went, I laughed about two hours later when I thought about him saying, <laughs> I think I just went, where's the fucking manager? Yeah, the fuck? I was in a rage. No, yeah. Oh, God, yes. But and then, then you ended up going back on stage. Then once I heard Jim, 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 I thought, ah, oh, the audience like me. I thought, I, I took that punch when it happened initially as a punch from the whole audience that the whole everyone had just said oh, i was shit and that was it fuck this guy yeah fuck this guy right and then once i heard the gyms i was like oh everyone's on my side that was a wonderful feeling yeah sure and so i, I came back out that was uh, it was very nice of them but i've since in the in the in the lovely town of manchester which i, I lived in for a long time um uh people came up to me in the bar going you go Oh, I was the guy. I was the I was the guy who ran on and tagged it. And there were about four guys maybe who walked up there. And the first sort of ten times I bought the guy a beer. And now I've probably met the actual guy, but I will not buy anyone a beer anymore because everyone's taking. They're pain. all taking the fucking piss. They couldn't have all been there. Yeah. The amount of the the the, the room only held four fifty. <laughs> I've met about seven hundred people who were at that gig. Right. <laughs> it's literally. That amount to the number of interns that worked at the hospital when they, Richard Gere came in with a gerbil up his ass. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because oh. everyone worked at that hospital for about six months. Yeah, yeah. Everyone you spoke to. I was working that night. Really? You brought him in. I don't believe he had a gerbil in his ass. <laughs> he just doesn't look like the type. I don't, I don't <laughs> want to. Like, like Two well, put together. Listen, we have questions live from Twitter. We bring them in. I, I asked ahead of time, and one of them was in fact from Derek uh, at Derek Seven One Two, who asks, 
I ask people to write specific questions to you, sure. for you. What's the most deviant thing he's ever done sexually? Now, clearly that's nobody's business, but the fact of the matter is, oh, I've done who's it. to say that someone out there isn't saying, you know what would be nice? <laughs> How nice, quickly can nice, you get a I'm, gerbil? I'm not, I've put a few things up my ass here and there, but only... But not living creatures? I'm not only sex toys, and, and I've been a hemorrhoid sufferer since the age of 25. So. Also in your uh, so my, research? My, my, uh, oh, my ass play days are over. I would, I have to hang my ass up and like a hoop on a hook. Um, I, yeah, so I, 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 yeah, nothing too, si like, I had, I had a threesome once with a guy that I'd met at a gig and then we picked up a girl together at a strip club. Sure. And we, we didn't know whether it was a prostitute or anything. It was just weird. And then she went down she went she went down on both of us. And I remember looking at the guy going, do we, are, we, are we paying this girl or is she just a nice person? <laughs> you know, and- Nice person. Yeah, well, like, very, very giving. She's a very pretty girl from Argentina. And you remember her hometown? I do, yeah. I remember she was Argentinian. Anyway, so I was laying on the bed and she was blowing me and he was fucking from behind. Okay. This is very early on in my days living in America before I'd really hit America, but this was a British guy who'd, who'd noticed me. So around 2006? Yeah, around that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was fucking her from behind and he was keeping eye contact with me. Uh-oh. And just... <laughs> Mayday. Right there, right? <laughs> Nothing's getting blown going. Because <laughs> that doesn't work for you. No. That doesn't and, do anything. And he pulls out. Sure. Comes on a back. All right. And goes, Jim Jeffries, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you have a fifth anniversary show with guest Jim Jeffries. That's a true story. It's Holy true story. fuck. And, and you've told that story before? I... Um, oh, it doesn't I've matter. tried telling it on stage a couple of times, but it seems a bit braggy or it's a bit gross. It never really flew. No, I haven't. And I don't think I've told it. In a, in and what a, it is is beautifully fucking real that very few people would ever share. Let there's alone there's loads more to the beginning of the story. We don't have all day, but it, it, it was. Uh, <laughs> oh. it, it was. Yeah, the lead up must have been something. I'll tell you the lead up. <laughs> I, I, Kenny, strap in. All right, this is a big lead up. I don't need to tell you any of the vital bit and the punchline, but how it happened was <laughs> I was at uh, South by Southwest or All Points West uh, Music Festival. Sure. This is actually before the HBO special, so it's really early on. So being, and it was uh, on in Jersey, but you're looking at the Statue of Liberty, like right there type of thing, right? All right. And you get, you get a ferry over and... I was staying in New York in Manhattan and I, this was like my second time ever in New York and I was there for the first, I performed on the first day of the festival and the second day of the festival AEG just gave me tickets and backstage passes and all that type of stuff and I got myself a bag of ecstasy and I just kept on taking pills and it rained, I was just, I didn't know anyone and I, I remember trying to talk to the Arctic monkeys because I thought they're British, they'll recognise me and they didn't, they didn't know us. And so the day ended with me feeling a bit sad for myself, but I was so wrecked I was trying to get out of the, the, the grounds, right? But they had a big chain link fence all around the thing, right? So I was walking along, running my hand along the fence with the hope that eventually I'd get to the end of the fence and go, oh, I'm out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that was my plan. If I keep on touching this fence, there has to be a gap in it. And this guy on the other side of the fence from Liverpool goes, fucking hell, man, Jim Jeffries, fucking hell, Jim Jeffries, man. And I went, I went, hey, man, how you doing? <laughs> and, he, and he went, he went, I'm fucking out here on a stag do. I actually live in Jersey, but I'm out here on a fucking stag do. And uh, it was just a bachelor party called stag do. And he goes, I'm out on a stag do. And he, go, I, he goes, we have a fucking stretched hummer with prostitutes and cocaine to the brim. And I climbed the fence, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I went, all right. That's I'm not what you want to hear when you're on ecstasy, I can't imagine. Yeah, I, I climbed over the fence and I got into this this, this stretched hammer and they had the most heroin ridden looking prostitutes. <laughs> and all this cocaine. And, and there was a little table in the middle with cocaine being cut on it. And this guy's like, look who I found. Oh my look God. Who I found. Now, I have no American profile. So now it's like their dickhead British mate has just brought an extra guy on to take our drugs. <laughs> 
person. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm sitting there already on drugs, feeling very unloved in this fucking hummer. Just, uh, oh god. We go to a strip club way out in the fucking boonies. Let's say Bayonne. Uh, yeah, in, in Jersey somewhere, and we get lap dances East and stuff like that. I remember because they ripped off my credit card like five hundred dollars, and I had to fight to get it back many hours, many days later. Genius. Anyway, so just to help you remember the story. Yeah, and so uh, satin dolls. It might have been. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So, it's anyway, be. so, so anyway, so I, 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 I say, look, I got to get back to Manhattan. The guy's like, no, you stand at my house now. He goes, it's like a hundred and fifty dollar cab ride back to Manhattan. And I'm like, oh, fuck, what have I done? Why have I, I got in this car? And, and I said, fuck it, get the cab ride. I'm going home. And I got in the car. And then this guy, the British guy, he goes, oh, I'm coming with you. And he jumped into the taxi with me. And then the two of us was like. All right, so I guess you're staying with me now. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went to a strip club, and the rest of the story is what happened. Holy but fuck. It was a quiet... Well, now we understand why he pulled out and uh, shouted your name. Yeah, and uh, look, you fucking, that guy could come a big load on coke, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. Um, that, that's probably the how, most, how that, about, the night the way, that I woke up going, oh, God, or, you know. How about that must be the greatest story he has to tell for the rest of his life? Uh, if you meant that much to him. I, I, yeah, I don't know, maybe. We also have him on Skype. Let's go to Eric in New Jersey. Eric? Eric. We do have Eric? Nope. Um, from at Ward Ruther asks, what's his, this is my favorite, what's his favorite non-CGI monster puppet creature from a movie and why? That's good, guy. That was one I, I hate... CGI. I've mentioned this before. Yeah. I, I'm a this puppet. This is a fan of yours. Yeah, I am uh, Yoda. Wait a second. Um, uh, uh, Non-CGI monster puppet creature. You're going to go with Yoda. I don't think of him as a monster. Non-CGI. He threw in the word monster. No, he's just Mo puppet. He's a puppet. He's a puppet creature. Yeah. Oh, he's puppet definitely creature. a puppet creature. It's the word monster that threw me. All right, then if we have to have monster puppet creature. No, I think just saying it doesn't have to be mon monster. Yeah, I, I will go no. something from Labyrinth no. if I have to go monster. Ooh, puppet creature. But, but David Bowie. <laughs> yeah, David Bowie's testicles in those tights. <laughs> in those tights. <laughs> in those tights when he was just he was all dick and balls. He was smuggling fruit. Yeah, he, he, he was absolutely there like, smuggling fruit. You've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, is this a distraction from your dick hanging out <laughs> in, in a kid's movie? I think, it, I, th I'm, I might be wrong, but I think they've fucking airbrushed his dick out from the original film. <laughs> I think there you is think a, they've remastered the film? I think there is a remastered non-dick <laughs> version, because there's the bit when those, all those, the goblins made the tunnel when they're... Josh, like they, I'm going to need a clip of that up on the screen here. You'll know what I mean. Exactly. He's wearing some dick-heavy... <laughs> uh, uh, pants. Anyway, Rod Stewart haircut. How going. Well, go what's wrong? What's, where are you going? How could we possibly go back to discussing Yoda at this point? I, I, well, I like Yoda, and that's what I was very upset when Yoda started uh, flying around and doing backflips. Because and the, this is the thing about CGI: it's the clothes. The clothes fuck it, because they always the material always moves like. And things like everything crinkles and moves like right. naturally. As soon as you put clothes, they're always flowing everywhere. Right. When Yoda, also Yoda was an old cunt, man. That, that was the thing I made fun of uh, for, for a while. Was why, how is he flying around now and dancing? Well, he probably used the force or yeah. something. I, I, yeah. Come on. Why do I, why'd I have to wait, suffer through this I'm, move I'm, for the I'm, first? I'm sorry, have you never seen an elderly person move for the early bird special? Yeah, true. Maybe he was hungry. True. hungry. <laughs> I, I, Kerry Fisher is in uh, Legit this year. Oh, nice. Which is on 10 p.m. FX Wednesday. Yeah, can we please talk a little bit about the show? <laughs> Would it kill you? No, but Kerry, Kerry Fisher's in the show, and it was for a role that I, I don't want to give too much away, but... It, it was one of those things where I went, maybe we could get Carrie Fisher, and you just fucking ask people and they show, it's quite amazing. Yeah. I, well, I know how much, you, you know, people get paid the same whether they're famous or not on the show, and Carrie Fisher was, fuck, I was, I was hanging out with her, and you forget how famous that woman is. Like, it's, I, I was telling a story about how I was on Kimmel, and I told a story about my mother, and my mother said, my mother said, you have to go back on the Kimmel show and tell America that you're a liar. Right. And I went, what? She goes, that story you told about me wasn't completely true and you embellished some of it. And I went, 
Mum, that's what I do for it's a living. It's really hard to get on these fucking shows. <laughs> you want me to? You want me to go on and say, "I'll just first a public apology." So I'm, I can apologise to you now. She goes, "I was so embarrassed." I go, "How are you embarrassed? You have no friends. <laughs> Embarrassment only applies when there's people to be embarrassed by." That's right. You know me and Dad and my brothers, and that's everyone, and none of us give a shit. So what are you embarrassed for? Right. So anyway, so I was telling this story to Kerry Fisher. And Carrie Fisher went, oh, I, my mother is exactly the same way when I tell stories about her on television. Her mother being, of course, a ridiculously famous Debbie Fisher. Yeah, and, uh, Debbie, Debbie Reynolds. Debbie Fisher. Debbie Reynolds. Yeah, Later Debbie married Reynolds. Married became, yeah, but Debbie Reynolds. And I'm, I'm there going, are you comparing Debbie Reynolds to my fucking mother? Yeah. <laughs> Don't bring up your stepmom, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like holy shit yeah how girl. about that she was like engaged to Dan Aykroyd married to fucking Paul Simon yeah, this yeah. woman's fucking Hollywood man yeah yeah she is the real deal yeah and Princess Leia and Princess Leia to boot yeah and she was fucking probably got wrecked every night on the set of Blues Brothers a little bit that would have been a good that would have been a good party that one some might have suggested her cameo in Shampoo I don't was, remember shampoo. It was based loosely on something. Well, Warren Beatty, mm. uh, yeah. Um, so how about uh, the creation of the show, if you would, please? The creation of the show comes from um, a real story which has been adapted over time. Um, but the real story is the story I tell on stage, uh, which is on, on my, I think, Alcohol Holocaust, one of my specials. And it was I, a friend of mine who I never tell their real names because uh, they've got parents and whatnot. Sure. Um, but, but my best friend from university, so their parents should be able to crack the code. <laughs> <laughs> my best friend from university uh, has a brother who has muscular dystrophy and he was, uh, we lived together and he used to come visit and everything. We were just a, a tight little group, you know, and we, um, we took him, when we thought he had a few, uh, maybe a year left, we took him out to a brothel to get a blowjob, yeah. which is legal in Australia. We took him to, the, to a place called, uh, uh, in Melbourne, called uh, the Daily Planet, which I like about Australians. They're never, there's never like, Any never connection? like girls or anything. It, it looks like the Daily Planet from Superman. It's got the big planet on the top. <laughs> and you're like, wow, I wonder what's in this shop. This will be a lot of comic books. Got to be blowjobs. Yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, it's a brothel. So we took him along. We got him a blowjob. Well, they don't want women accidentally wandering in there. Yeah, yeah, Excellent exactly. Point. Very good. Excellent point, Sammy. <laughs> so, uh, so it was the story of me taking a friend uh, to a to a brothel, and when we first made the show, that was the pilot episode. We were going to get a character. We were going to take him out to and Sammy uh, auditioned to play the the muscular dystrophy character. Mm -hmm. the, the part went to DJ Qualls, and as I said to you when oh, you no. came in, There's a no. far more disabled-looking <laughs> person than you yeah. got the role. I've lost a number of parts we, like that. We to also uh, we also auditioned. See, I always think like DJ. He probably looks like Mackenzie Crook's career. Like, ah, I could have. Yeah. He's another ag looking actor. <laughs> um, but Under uh, special skills on his resume. Ag looking. Ag looking. I'll tell you what. DJ Qualls has as a special skill, and there, there must be Guinness. Better come and check this out. He's lost his virginity on film. Seventy-one times. Uh, no, like a realistic over 25 times or something stupid like that. It's a, it's a, a very large... He lost his virginity on my show. Right. Every movie... He, he, imagine going through life knowing that the world thinks you look like a virgin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they really do. Right. They think, okay, we've got to get a virgin. What would he look like? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah and, and, and he should be of age where it's surprising. How could you oh, still yeah. be a virgin? He's yeah. older than me. He, he, he looks still young. He's like 39 or something. Still a virgin. <laughs> in every film. He, he, could, yeah. he could walk into a room By the holding, way, does that holding get him laid his children. <laughs> People would go, virgin. Does that get him laid in real life? Um, the, no, he's been laid in real the, life. Yeah, he's. No, no, I mean, does, does that help him close that, that women want to crack? I don't, yeah. I, me and DJ have become very close friends, but I've never, because the whole time he's known me, I've had a girlfriend and now a baby and all that type of stuff. Mm. 
Um, and I, he doesn't seem like he's not like a pussy hound. <laughs> okay. But but me and him, like me and Bacadol will chat about the female extras, like oh, yeah, she's nice, like that. We're like he's married with a couple of kids, but right. we'll still be old pervs. We don't do anything about it, but we'll still be a At bit. At some point, you get to look. Yeah, yeah, we're a bit pervy. Like no, we always pick when there's a lot of extras. We pick the one we like, and then we have that little argument in our high chairs, where where we sit there in our high chairs going going, what, that one? Really? Oh, look, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, no, I like him like that. Really? That fat? Really? <laughs> right, so we have, our, we have our little game that we play with the one that we want to get, and then, like, we're still the shyest guys in the world. We still don't go talk to him. But that's what I was saying to you before we started this show. We have a way of gauging whether a girl is too young to have sex with on the set. And this is the way. Now, John Ratzenberger is on the show. Uh, who's Cliff Clavin from Cheers. Now, if a girl on the set goes, oh, you're Cliff Clavin from Cheers, then she's at an appropriate age to have sex with. But if she goes, you're Hammy the Pig from Toy Story, too young. Can't have, can't have sex if they think it's Hammy the Pig from Toy Story. And you've shared this with John? Uh, this, this John, knows, John knows the little theory I've got. John, my, my nieces came onto set once and John was so good with them because he just did every character off, oh. off, the, off every Pixar film that yeah. he did. And these two little ki Australian kids who were like 10 and 8 were just sitting there just, oh my God. And then I went, yeah, he doesn't do the voices, I do the voices. <laughs> And, and they, they went, what? What? Yeah, I, I do. I'm Hammy the pig. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> they didn't fucking know. <laughs> no. now, they're, now they're like telling their friends, their uncle does it. I'll tell you something cute about my, my niece. I never told this on any, anything. This made me laugh the other day. My brother came for Christmas and through till about mid-January. Could you get rid of him? It was a long time. And I love my brother and I love his family and all that type of stuff. But me and my brother have a history that goes back to my birth. And we have brother shit that goes on little niggly things we can do to each other he does things to me sort of like if i suggest something like like if if you are oh, like take him to a fast food place try this this is the best thing to eat here he'll get something else right because obviously i'm a fucking moron because i'm his little <laughs> brother right so he'll do little bits like that and i got into a bit of a huff about it and just went all right fucking i don't know anything i only fucking live here like he's going the best days to go to disneyland i go you, you don't want to go those days no well Susie, just trust me on this and then i was like and then this fight just out of nothing just escalated to get out of my fucking house <laughs> you and your fucking hell oh, you get the fuck out you've all been here too long it, it, it went to that level oh right oh god right and the, what really stopped the fight was my 10 year old niece turned to her mother with tears in her eyes and went does this mean we don't have a famous uncle anymore <laughs> <laughs> and I went I went that's all they think it's just, for them it's exciting because sure. their uncle lives in Hollywood and is on television to America. yeah yeah and, and, the, and the, my sister-in-law was like no you still have a famous uncle. We just have to get out of his yeah, house Yeah, you now. just won't be seeing him anymore. Yes. <laughs> you'll, you'll still be related. Um, you can still say that. <laughs> we had a kid at my school who uh, we used to tease r r relentlessly. I can't remember. I think it was I, can't remember, I think it was Alistair Shipman. Could have been Alistair Shipman. If it's Alistair Shipman's listening, it mightn't have been you, but it was one of these kids we teased relentlessly. And this kid was a bit of a nerd, and he, he fucking... And I was no not nerd myself. My mother was a school teacher. I'm not putting down the... Uh, downtrodden or, or, or trying to dress myself up as a bully, but any kid would bully in this situation. This kid used to claim that he was Arnold Schwarzenegger's godson. Uh-oh. Now, we're living in, in Sydney going, can you just shut the fuck up? Like, uh, yeah, oh yeah, like you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then every, why don't you get your, uh, your godfather Arnold to come and help you out? We would tease this guy relentlessly. His story went that his father um, owned some gyms in America and they were good friends back in the bodybuilding era. Sure. And uh, that's how they think. And we teased this guy. I reckon I teased him about it for 10 years. And then, and then he went on holidays and came back and pictures with him with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you know what? As a kid, you, you go, you, you sort of, you never apologize. You go, ah, oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you really should go. I'm sorry for making your life hell for all these years. You go, ah, who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm just sorry, Alistair Shipman. Hmm. 
I hope you guys gave that kid shit just on that alone. I think it was Alice's ship. Alice, Alice, it mightn't have was been. Was he a playwright from the 1800s? Yeah. It mightn't have been Alice's ship, and it might have been another guy. So I'm feeling weird. I was a I was a class A bullshitter as a kid as well. I would lie. I, and as you become an adult, you lie less and less. Like I might stretch things on stage, but in my personal life, I try very hard not to lie, and it only still trying though. You know, no, it is a battle yeah. because your brain often, like my girlfriend, will go, "Where were you?" And I think rather than tell the truth, I go like this: I go, "Nothing, just down at Ralph's." <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe you're not using that voice, right? Yeah, Maybe that's yeah. the giveaway. And, and she can tell when I'm lying, and like no one's business. More than any, more than my mother, more than anyone in my life, she can tell when I'm lying. And so I've learned not to lie around her. I try to be as honest as possible. Sometimes I admit truths. I just mm -hmm. don't mention things, but. Uh, but she can tell if I'm lying, right? And I used to lie constantly as a kid, just about stupid things. Like, like if you were having Christmas, you go like, "What are you eating for Christmas?" And they'd be like, "Having a, we're having a turkey." And you're like, "Really? Having a turkey? Is that? My family's eating kangaroo, so." <laughs> guess your family's poor you know I like lie <laughs> you know I just lie about stupid shit and then my where, what are you doing this summer my my uh, family's uh, going on holidays to Bulgaria it's really nice there this time of year like and then afterwards as a kid you go what did I lie for now the other kids are going to ask me how Bulgaria was and I don't, I've never been to fucking Bulgaria now I'm caught in this lie forever but now I do a weird thing as an adult I think I stopped lying like stopped lying at sort of 25 like really stopped right where now I'll, I'll make a conscious effort, and now sometimes I'll just start lying to a person, and halfway through it, and it's very weird when you do this to a person, I go, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's the, most, it's the best. The best. The truth will set you free, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I go, it's, I'm lying. The last two minutes has all been a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, lie. When anyway. you do it, people are disappointed with you. They're quite. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You don't know why I did that? Yeah. And I killed someone once. <laughs> exactly. That was all I... Throw that in the mix. Um, yeah. I want to offer up as we... Um, they're coming to the conclusion here. Brace yourself. Mm. Um, have to... Okay, we got the assaulted on stage. You already covered that. Yes. I'm just checking my phone for the time. Sorry. It's 9.30. Holy, holy. Yeah, he holy. would see that as 20... 2.30 or 20.30. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Holy, holy. 18, 18. That went by like that. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I meant that, that as a compliment. I, I, thought, I thought we'd been talking about 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, that's 21. That's the best compliment uh, yeah. I could ever get for the show, one that I enjoy. I would be doing this by myself if you weren't here. <laughs> well, do you think this you're is less like, crazy I, if there are people here. At home, I sit and talk <laughs> like this. My girlfriend said to me once, she goes, I don't know why people bother any of you. You just talk. Right? And then going, oh, is that a bad thing? She goes, oh, I don't know. It depends on the interviewer. Some well, of this being our fifth anniversary, I will tell you that my favorite kind of guest is yeah. the one that I asked a total of three questions. Oh, good. I got to five. For, that's true. And we talked for an hour and a half. Yeah, trust me. I've sat here for five years. He's very lazy. Yeah. All right. Uh, this, uh, the, some of uh, the fans, we asked them to put together. His hat's a cross between Pinocchio and Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> it's, right bang, it's right bang in the middle. <laughs> Thank you for that. I've been trying to pick it. And both of them beloved characters. By the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like they were evil bastards. Nope. Except for that Crystal Skull film. Uh oh. Another uh -oh. childhood raping movie. <laughs> from, from the, from I think the South people Park who did bought you the on that. Phantom sure Menace. South Park did a wonderful episode on that. I stopped watching South Park for a while. Oh, well, that was the that was the episode. Was there? They're like they're, the boys are crying because they went to see Crystal Skull and they're like, why is George Lucas and Steven Spielberg raping Indiana Jones? And they showed like that was the movie. <laughs> yeah, that was. The I thought episode. that you were making reference to that. Oh no, the term <laughs> the term raping my childhood has been around since the Phantom Menace. Yeah. We've been using it for. Although I I I liked the. The first three Star Wars, well, the first two Star Wars is the one episodes one and two because that was when I was heavily into drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so have you, have you rewatched? I them saw sober? both of them fucking wasted. And yeah. thought, that was pretty good. And I have watched them not wasted. And they're not good films. No. Yeah. Uh, so we asked the fans to put together a series of five questions. Sure. Uh, specifically designed for the guest. Mm -hmm. We have a name for this. Uh, it's called Tweet Five. Team Five! Team Five! Team Five! He's uh, just realizing the same setting as you in the documentary. 
uh, that I enjoyed very much uh, editing. Um, okay. Have you seen a fat eye on camera? All right. Well, well it was not a good st uh, pose when you were leaning back. Yeah, that's not helpful. Yeah, there you go. Speaking of Santa Claus, um, at Mid City Mike offers up this tweet five. These are Coke or Pepsi, no correct answer. Okay. Cocaine or alcohol? Uh, alcohol, can I, can I extend the, the argument? <laughs> Um, There's no stopping you. Yeah, um, cocaine is obviously more fun than alcohol. Is it? But alcohol is like my wife. Sure. And cocaine is like a dirty slut I see behind her back. Yeah, guma. Gotcha. I have I have more fun with her, but I don't trust her, and I always go back to beer. <laughs> There's no way that's the first time you said those words. I've been asked this question before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Blondes or brunettes? Ah, uh, blondes. I'm a brunette man myself. Comedy or sleep? Uh, sleep. That's a tough one, isn't yeah. it? Well, he's got a kid now. That's not fair. Yeah. London or New York? London. Paul Hogan or Hulk Hogan? Paul Hogan. Yeah, that's come on. Not that's, even... that's a joke question. And I don't find it humorous. No. Um, um, we didn't comedy, get to the... The comedy or sleep one's an interesting one because... Yes, please. I, I can live without comedy. Ah. You know what I mean? Not happily. Can you? I think so. I beg I, I, to I, differ. But there has to come a day when it ends, right? When you're just an old bloke and you're in a nursing home. What are you going to do? Well, okay. You know, I'm allowed to be still funny with my mates, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I, I see that comedy is, so, look, comedy is so important in my world. And as I said, I'm so bad at sports that I, in my home right now, where other dads would look at their child and go, look, he just kicked the ball. It's very good coordination, how he did that, right? I don't give a fuck what he does in that. My son... When he says something funny. My son lifted his ass up, farted, and laughed. And I went, he, he knows that's funny. <laughs> right? That was like a real, like, proud dad moment for me. See, see he, he did it. He lifted it. Normally, he used to just sit there and fart. And not but he thought But he thought even this motion's a bit... <laughs> He did a take. It's a bit humorous, yeah. right? And, then he went, and he chuckled to himself like he wasn't trying to sell it to the room. He just went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is pretty fantastic. That is. That, and then I, I realized that, like, I was speaking to another young dad, another dad with a young child. Yeah. He was going, can you kick a ball yet? I was like, Who I cares? haven't even tested. Who cares? Yeah. I'm not sure. You he he, he, just he can pick one up and walk around like an idiot with it. But, yeah. you know. Um, I fucking love that to pieces. That he did the bit, and that's what made you the proud. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought he's got a sense of humor because there's plenty of people who don't really have them. Yeah. Well, or they have them, they know what they like, but they can't produce the stuff to make other people laugh. Well, how about your sense of humor has paved the way for all of it? All uh, of what? All that is your uh, bounty. What you mean, made me money? Uh, I mean the roof over your head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you wear I, I often lay in my house and I got a big house and I <laughs> think, fucking hell, man, yeah. jokes paid for this. Your sense of humor specifically is is that I want to uh, really sort of tap into because you have to keep putting out these jokes. Yeah, yeah. So it isn't necessarily a band of jokes it, as much as it is. Your particular bent. When you saw Eddie Murphy in those little 30-second yeah. clips, you saw a guy at the top of his game. Yeah. It, granted, in a leather jumpsuit with gloves on. And 20 years old as well. And 20 fucking years old. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Truly. Yeah. Already masterful. But I respect now that he won't do stand-up because he, he knows it would take him too long to get that good again. Or if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Because like, the, 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 the point of view, as you are experiencing in your own life with a little one, hmm. evolves, becomes something else. But I guarantee if you walk on stage tomorrow, as you will in the next city, and where can people go to on the website? What's the website? I, um, just to try well, to get tickets? Ticketmaster is probably the best place to get, there you to get tickets. It will be on my webpage as well, but uh, when's this going out? April 1st, Fool's Day. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the, um, I will, I'll tell you what I will plug, which won't be on my webpage. I will be performing, I think it's April f 6th, April, April Foolishness for Kevin and Bean. 
who I've always at the Gibson Amp, at the Gibson Amphitheatre in Los Angeles. Yes, look at that. I, I'll be I'll be going on at that, and it's all for charity. I think it's the last time it was the Wounded Warriors. I don't know what it is this time, but it's always a good charity, and right. I, I know they've still got a, maybe a thousand tickets left. I don't think the Gibson Amphitheatre exists anymore. Isn't that one Universal? That no, the away? Universal. Yeah, Universal. The, the yeah. Universal one, the big. Yeah, the, 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 the like eight thousand seats. It's yeah, a big, it's, a big it's a nice space. indoor. Yeah, it's an indoor theater. gig. It's a. We saw, I think, I want to say Eddie Izzard there. Conan. And Conan. I just saw Conan there. Right. I saw Clapton there. Let's uh, all shake hands. Yeah, I, I saw myself there when I did it <laughs> last time, and it was a wonderful. That was. It was one of the first times I ever performed on a stage where there was a big ass screen where I could see the screen at all times. Oh shit. And if I turn this way, I could look and that was the probably the best way to check how bald I'm going. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? Because the camera was delay set. too. I didn't right? do it, but a few times on stage I went, I can never get this angle. <laughs> At home. At home. <laughs> <laughs> Your screen isn't big enough at home. Yeah, yeah. Clearly. Because you need to hold another mirror with a mirror there, and it's never a great test. But yeah. I could I could close up, go, oh, well, that's not going as... I'll as give like you some it. advice. Right. You need to stop looking. What, with the baldness? Yeah, just stop looking. Get a Pinocchio hat? Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, was in, I was in Nashville the Get other day. Get a Pinocchio day. hat is the correct I was answer. in Nashville the other day doing gigs. Everyone wears a cowboy hat. If they don't wear a cowboy hat, they wear a trucker's hat. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, why doesn't every bald person move to Nashville? <laughs> Yeah, it's the most equal playing field of them all. Because everyone's in a hat? Everyone's wearing a hat! <laughs> and if you don't wear a hat, you look like a fucking idiot. Why aren't you wearing a hat? Yeah. Right? Nashville is where, where it's at for the bald people. Yeah. I'm moving there in like five years. I'm Nashville and up. <laughs> oh. I don't even like the music. I'm just, all right, this is how I look. And then you can only get the disappointment when, when you've got the woman, but you've already got it back to the house by that stage. We never got to the George Lazenby. Oh, George Lazenby. George Lazenby plays my dad. Yeah. In Legit. And he, and also I will give a shout out to Magda Sabansky, who is a huge star in Australia, who plays my mother who was the only actress I wanted to play my mum. And I actually fought with FX because they said, we can get someone out here. And I said, no, this is the lady. And they had to pay for the business class flights and the hotels, which wasn't really in our budget. But I had to have this act. I was willing to do it out of my own pocket like I wanted her so much. And she's like an overweight lady. You'll know her as she was the farmer's wife in the movie Babe. Okay. Um, was the only thing she ever did in America. But she's a very popular sketch comic uh, in Australia. Anywho... After she finished our season of the show, she's, she's just been paid a big wad of money by Jenny Craig to lose like 80 pounds. And if she doesn't lose that much, she doesn't get the money. So next season, I have to figure out a way, reason to explain the weight loss? that my mum's gotten so thin right. all of a sudden. Because it can't be Jenny Craig paying her. But anyway, we had George Lazenby play my father, who... Um, George, if you don't know who he is, was James Bond for one movie. Uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. He replaced Sean Connery and he was the biggest paid male model in the world in 1969. There's a phenomenal documentary that's been on for a little while now about the whole history of James Bond. And when they get to that point right. where the world is basically in agreement on one thing, mm. no one can replace Sean Connery. Yeah. This poor son of a bitch had no shot. But this is the no thing. No matter who this is stepped the thing. in. George is the biggest pussy hound in the world. As it turns out. As it turns out. Now, if you watch that documentary because I just incidentally I watched this four days ago mm. and the documentary so they go through Sean Connery comes off as a bit of a prat about it sure like, like come on they made you rich and he's always like oh, these people screwed me no one screwed you and then like Roger Moore's like I wanted to give the character a more sensual feel and maybe a bit more comedy than he had before and then Timothy Dalton was like I wanted to make him more gritty and then everyone was talking about the acting about it right except for when it gets to George and George went like this Oh, I was fucking brilliant. I was having sex with six women a day. <laughs> That's what he says in the documentary. Yeah. He, goes, oh, he goes, they gave me a helicopter, and I could get this helicopter. We were filming in the French Alps, and I could get this helicopter and fly it down to a village, pick up some girl, screw her, and then off I went. <laughs> and then he goes, when the movie was coming out, he goes, when the movie was coming out, it was 1970 by now, and... It was all about free love and all that type of stuff and people had long hair and beards and I was walking around with this short haircut looking like I was a fucking banker or something and you know, who wants to, who wants to walk around trying to get laid looking like that? So I showed up at the red carpet with long hair and a beard and he wasn't allowed to walk the red carpet, Yeah. right? Because that's not how they wanted their James Bond to look. And then I'm like, what did you just shave your fucking beard? Like, 
two sentences ago, you were saying you were fucking six women a day. That was the greatest thing. Had that the dropped job. off to five during the seventies, you were still fucking James Bond. Anyway, so I'll tell you my greatest George story. This is the greatest thing. One of the greatest sentences in conversation history. I'm not picking this up enough. What I'm about to say. Holy shit! I'm sitting in a makeup chair, and on one side of me, I have. John Ratzenberger, Cliff Clavin from Cheers. And on the other side, I have George Lazenby, James Bond. This is the first time I've sat there and the two of them are trying to get along and I'm sort of sitting there like a child, like this is pretty cool for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and John goes, hey George, uh, yeah, what's your, where do they film that uh, Majesty's James Bond film? And then he goes, oh, all over Europe. We went all over Europe. Yeah, a lot of it was, a lot of it was in France. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love France. I think fr France is probably my favorite bit of Europe. Uh, you, you like France, George? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I fucking like France, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he goes, eh, what's, your, what's your favorite bit of France? <laughs> and then George goes, well, there's a place in Italy where you can fuck the prostitutes by the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's his favourite part of France. That's his favourite bit of France. <laughs> There's a place in Italy where you can fuck the prostitutes by the side of the road. <laughs> now, you've got to remember, we're in a makeup trailer, so there's three women, one doing my hair, one doing his makeup, another one doing John's hair. Sure. And they're just all looking in the, in the mirrors like... <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I went, and I'm just sitting next to him going, in, was it in fields? <laughs> was, was, there little, was there little huts? <laughs> Or were you just fucking them against like the railing on the side of the motorway? <laughs> How does this Was work? there a caravan? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a fucking brilliant place in Italy. Fucking. And that's his favorite spot in France. That's his favorite spot in France. But I, look, I, I mean no disrespect to George. I found him charming and fascinating to be around. And, well, how could he not? And the guys, the guy, he was married to Pam Schreier, the tennis player, for years. Yeah. He's got, he's got young twins with him. And, and he, he, he uh, children of his? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't really? know he's got like, he got, he, yeah. He's probably done a few young twins in his day as well. But I just, it's, it's a bygone era from 1960. Imagine being the best looking man in the world in 1960, right? When you Can't. Could, when you could slap a woman on the ass in the office place, and if she complained, you go, you know how, how she gets. <laughs> yeah. That's and why no, we love Mad Men. Yeah, and, by no, the way. and no one would ever say. And, and like, okay, so he was the best looking one living in London in the swinging 60s, right? With an Australian accent when no one really traveled that far in this world. You had to get there by boat, right? The pussy this man got. I have the best nickname for him ever because he, he told me a story that literally went like this. He goes, oh, I'd be at parties. And on the ground, they just... How old is he now? He's like 70-something. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's, I'd be at parties. It'd be just birds all over the floor, just girls everywhere just laying around all naked and fucking John Lennon's cock would be there. Peter Sellers' cock would be <laughs> over there. So my nickname for him is Bicurious curious George. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't know what I... Okay, nope. okay bye, Curious George. What? 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 What, what does he mean by that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, hey, man. I can't thank you enough, and we're only uh, finishing the show because you're out of water again. I, I, uh, I feel like maybe something coming on. I'm trying to keep hydrated. Oh, okay. No. Always a good idea. Yeah. Um, honestly and truly, so Wednesdays on the FXX... How many X's? Two now? Two X's. We're one X away from a parody, a porn parody. Uh -huh. Which is what I've always wanted from the show. By the way. Every sitcom, I want to have a porn parody. I'll tell you one last story. This is not really funny. It's probably not the best story to end with. <laughs> but on the, on the show, we have Mindy Sterling, yeah. who, who, is, who, if you, you're familiar with Groundlings, is a great improvised actor. Mm -hmm. um, she's best known as Dr. Evil's mm -hmm. wife. In the Files Austin, this brother, yeah. yeah, in the Austin Powers movie. Oh yeah, we know. Each other. And I said to her, I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a? Just say, me and Minnie get along very well. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we had like a porn parody? Yeah. And she went, what? Yeah. What? What? <laughs> what are these things? What are you talking about? Why? Why? What a porn? What? <laughs> and I went, you know, like where they 
porn actors dress up like us and there's some weak storyline and we have you know because also we play we deal with a lot of mentally handicapped people and stuff in our show it could be a very interesting porno and and then I go and then she goes people really do these things and it took me maybe two minutes to find out that there was three Austin Powers porn parodies already in each one of them she was getting fucked by Dr. Evil or spit roasted by Dr. Evil and Austin Powers <laughs> sure and so when that spit lovely roasted, by the way. that lovely moment wearing. when you get to reveal that to a person who didn't know it existed <laughs> oh. I mean, to, to, a, to a more mature lady who doesn't watch porn ever and just go here's here's a version of you <laughs> being what we call spit roasted yeah. DP, do you know what a DP is? <laughs> Not a director of photography. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fucking amazing. By the way, that's uh, my favorite story, and thank you. Oh, that one, for, you like that one the most. That <laughs> was my, yeah. No, no, uh, this has been ridiculous. I can't believe, by the way, uh, that uh, we got to spend our fifth anniversary this way, so thank you. Oh, thank you for very, very much, me. honestly. Appreciate it. And, um, and, and, and to all your uh, glorious success, honestly, it, it's all come from, from up here, and that's pretty fucking astonishing, and that was the point I was attempting but failed to make earlier. No, I appreciate that. Oh. But, uh, you made me a little bit scared right now. All right. Because well, that can slip away at any time. Well, well, unless you got your looks in your hair, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just winked at each other simultaneously. I don't know if you guys caught that. At the same time, we winked. It was creepy. Yeah. Well, there's a new DP coming. <laughs> To a theater near you. Oh, uh, yeah, the Kevin Pollock parody. <laughs> it would be a British one. It would be called Kevin's Bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Please, someone come through with that. Oh. Jamie's still taking notes. Um, we end each show. I did not tell you ahead of time. Mm hmm with a game that uh, our own, our head writer, Jamie, uh, came up with called the Larry King Game. Okay. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, since it's our fifth anniversary, mm -hmm. we've come through with this tradition. So what it is, is you'll be doing a bad Larry King impression. I don't want a good one, so all the pressure's off. Oh, I want I, a bad I, one, because a bad one makes me laugh. And it's that moment where Larry would look into the cameras, and before he'd go to the phones, he would share something about himself. And it was something nobody needed to know. So you're reenacting that moment, basically. Anything about Larry from his uh, 300 years on the planet. And then when you go to the phone, that the name of the city is funny sounding, it's going to top. That's going to be the button to the bit. Oh, I don't, I don't ever watch Larry King. This is very <laughs> nerve wracking. Yeah, that's, well, that's even better. I have better. gigged with him once. Oh. But I've never worked with him. Okay, so that's going to make this fresh and new. And that's fine. I know he, yeah. he's the suspenders and has a lot of high eyebrows. That's right. Yep. And it so doesn't matter what the voice quality is, because I want a bad one. I don't want a good one. I, well, I, I don't know. It's so then, as Larry shares something about him, and then go to the phones, and that's the whole bit. Okay. Uh, that into that camera right there when you're ready. No, what do I have to say? How long Anything is at Larry all. King? Anything. So next up, we have a uh, great guest, uh, Mr. Jim Jeffries. Something that he doesn't know was uh, one time I was on a bachelor party in New York with a stretched Hummer and we had quite the night. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a caller from Poughkeepsie. <laughs> Perfect! And that's how you play the fifth anniversary Larry King game. Is that all right? That's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Honestly and truly. It's a callback. I'll tell you, when you I see him. Who doesn't love, I love When you callback. see him do stand up. Yeah. He does stand up now. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not bad. It's a, he's right. a storyteller. But we we did it we did it a thing. But I when the audience watches him, what they want to see is they want to see him go. I I was uh, interviewing uh, Liza Minnelli. We cut to an ad break and she farted. That's what people want to hear from yeah, him, right? That's all they want. And to then hear. there was this smoking up the room, and I didn't know, and I had three five heart attacks, so I could, went back to smoking to make it smell okay. Some, you want to hear some story like that? But instead, he talks about when he was in primary school. Yeah, me and my friends when we were five. <laughs> yeah, he does. He used to shit on the train tracks and see. <laughs> How much? Yeah. He does. Nobody cares. He literally does a story like that. So Bob died. <laughs> <laughs> and we told his parents that he wasn't shitting on the train tracks and we'd all get in trouble, which was funny until Lenny died. <laughs> Every story has someone dying. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, there is some. Because he's 105. Yeah, he's outlived everyone he's ever known. Yeah. I was, he's been married like six times. Uh, yeah, seven, uh, once, uh, uh, twice to the same. How? Well, who's got the time? <laughs> well, who's got the money for that much alimony? Um, 
Thank you very much. Please sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the folks at home. I've we'll had get my flyer done the whole time. <laughs> also, uh, the seventh time in our five years that that has happened. So please, yeah, please embrace that. Sammy? Yeah, buddy. Happy anniversary, buddy. Happy anniversary to you. Here First round's are. on Kenny. I'm very excited to get out of here. So we, <laughs> He's made that clear. Yep. Jamie, thanks for putting up with all of it. It's been a scant five years. Hey, you let me uh, take off and go to Disney World whenever, so it's fine. It's paid for it all. <laughs> yeah, you let me do the occasional independent feature. I'm, I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, uh, and thank you for coming back after that. I oh, thought we pleasure. would have lost you. Never. Thanks to uh, Josh and JMac out there running the ship from the outer edges. Samantha for applying the makeup and attempting to make us look uh, presentable. Uh, Daniel Overlin, our media maven. And um, they really they're making it. up their own jokes out there. Yeah. Well, it's got to be better than something. They're probably making fun of you. Oh, let's That's hope. what I would be doing. Let's hope. We missed our uh, the greatest, yes, you would, the greatest intern the world has ever known. Um, He's a very fine dancer. David Mandel, yeah. Miss him horribly. Uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, please write to us at contact at KevinPollockChatShow.com. Daniel Overland. Daniel Overland. What did I say? What did you say? Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> See, I thought I heard it wrong. I was like, surely he said Danielle, but my ears are just filled with shit. By the way, how lame is it that that's funny? I, I warmed them up for it's you. It's a bunch of children <laughs> out there. What do you want? Well, I will say, call back to what, the place I volunteer at. The kid, like the second graders think it's so funny when you could give the give the wrong gender to the to the name. Oh, so that's the funniest thing. Ever. I have a bunch of second graders out there. Yeah, basically. there we have it. It's nice to know that the that the crew is devolving. Um, Danielle Overland, please forgive me and tell your brother Daniel I said hey. Uh, oh, she must be out there by now. That must also be adding to it. Um, all right, kids, that's it for now. And until next time, man, as always, get out of my face. <laughs>